And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet. It is the season finale of a sorts of the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the te here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the man who has survived two days with me at 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 a convention, and the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Zan. <laughs> Aren't you saying that you should have been surviving me at the convention? Mulligan. <laughs> Mulligan. At the, ver at the very least, everybody loses a bet because we didn't start a fight. This is true. We painted the town black and blue. Mm -hmm. Um... Of course, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure there's. I'm pretty sure there's one of. I'm pretty sure there's one. Per there's one person in a, cer in a certain Discord who it who um will probably be running away in fear if he ever sees me with a pool noodle again. <laughs> you and me both. Uh. Um. But like I said, this is the season finale because this is the final episode of our look through the Level Up Five E playtest. And and I had to I had to call a bit I had to call a bit of an audible when it comes to this. First off, originally I had originally I had pl I had planned on doing the combat maneuvers part of the playtest this week, but when I looked at it, a lot of it is just a codification of the core rules with the combat maneuvers and what we and some of the new um, combat styles. That have that have cropped up over the last few months, just just putting them all together in one package, which really they should have done earlier. But and the the one after that was combat, which didn't really it didn't really strike me out as doing enough interesting things compared compared to the vanilla combat section. A lot of it is a little too similar. There's a few things that are that are different, but not not enough, not enough for a full for a full video. Um, the one after exactly. that is journeys, which is the one we're going to be focusing on, and the and what they are calling the final playtest document, which was which was just a glorified blog post covering the capstone abilities for all the classes. Which I think I. Th because of that, um, we're going to be doing a bit of a twofer. So first, we're going to be focusing on the journeys chapter, and then we're going to be doing um, the capstone abilities. Yep. Now, the journey document is around twenty pages, and it's supposed to cover the exploration part of ro of the role playing setup. So this is. As uh, as Ash was putting it week after week, seeing the exploration next, this is that third pillar that they wanted to build. This is the exploration pillar. Yes. And I'm going to be honest at my initial overview of this. Um, it doesn't feel like exploration. We'll we'll have time we'll have time to delve to delve into that as, as we go in, but. The first thing that they open with is is na is navigation, um, and the and they bring up the importance of ha of having a map, or using a scouting journey activity. Mm -hmm. They also uh, introduce us to terms that they're going to use specifically for exploration, um, such as the fact that there are four types of encounters, being monsters. Exploration challenges, social, and scenery. Mm -hmm. um, they then further granulate that with exploration challenges being something like a geographical issue, like a broken bridge, or an event such as a tornado. And because of where I come from, I ha I have to do this. <laughs> I'm in Tornado Alley. This I is legally required. Fly. <laughs> um. Let's see, ha Haven, a location where heroes can recover from fatigue or or strife by resting by a bonfire. We uh, 
We don't talk about that. They need to have their humanity restored first, Monk. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, th th this Haven glossary term, when I first saw it, gave me pause. And there are rules associated with it that make me go, oh, no. Um, then, then, then they, then they seek to define what a region is, and I'm like, but, but everybody intuitively knows what a, what a region is. But they're like regions are separate areas of stuff that people travel through, and each have their own encounter tables and properties. It's a, it's a. I'm like, yeah, it's like traveling from. Texas to 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 California. Those are two different regions, each with their own encounter tables and properties. Yes. And then a dreaded word that I that I never like seeing in in these unless the, unless you really intend to go super hardcore. It's the reason I never played New Vegas on hardcore because it was not fun. Supply which is a thing that gets consumed when you rest. We'll get we'll get to I'll have something to say on that kind of thing. I'll get to I'll get to that in a minute. I understand that ammo has weight in the real world, but god damn it, when I am a man with 95 guns and all of the ammunition to shoot rad roaches in the wastes, I don't need my ammo to weigh anything. Fuck your supply mechanic. Yeah, um, I will. I will. Free, I will freely admit I've never been a. I've never been a big. Fan, I've never been a big fan of game of games that are making you micromanage and micromanage encumbrance when, especially when you're giving people loot out the fucking ass. They're like, oh, you should. You should just have a bag of holding. Bags of holding can only hold so much. Same thing goes with portable holes. Uh, portable hole inside a bag of holding. <laughs> Absolutely not. We've learned from the engineer incident. What's funny about the engineer incident is that that arrow was designed by my party about three years before that came out on on TG. <laughs> I'm I'm sure I'm sure it was. But I don't think anybody in your party was turbo nerd enough to actually put out a fucking diagram on how it would work. No, I was. <laughs> See, that I believe. <laughs> they were like, I want to do this and this because it'll cause massive amounts of damage. I'm like, mechanically, how would that work? How are you going to make it so that these two do not just suddenly accidentally combine in your quiver and you die? And it was then that I was gripped by a demon and, <laughs> and created my own way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So next they go into travel pace, which um, works a bit, which is just how just um based on the based on the thing here, how much distance you're covering per day, and and if you're and if you're if you have to track something like that very granularly, that's actually a good good table. But I know a lot of narrators, game masters, dungeon masters, whatever you want to call them, uh, don't necessarily track that so rigidly. They just they have a pace, and there's a certain amount of counters they may want the, the characters to hit, and they'll roll those dice as they go. I it was, really depends on, on style of play. I was going to think... Of, I was thinking about whether or not this is the kind of thing you would track if you're doing a hex crawl, and still not not in that kind of sense. Um, I'm not sure about your experiences with hex crawl style play, but in in my experience, it's always been um, a understood agreement that one hex equals a certain time measurement. Like say, one hex equals one day of in-game time. Yeah, usually it's a time measurement rather than an exact measurement of 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 um, distance, mm -hmm. because as we all know, distance and time are the same thing, people just measured differently yeah um i the only time i would track something this granularly is if i had a specific time limit based on events i've done it for a couple of campaigns where 
my PCs are investigating something. And they have to travel from place to place to place, picking up clues as they go. And if they get lost along the way, whether that's getting inside a dungeon or just traveling through the wrong areas, they're losing time. I once had the PCs get to the place they needed to get to for the finale of that particular leg in the campaign um, late by literally four hours. The army of big bad evil monsters had already come through, sacrificed a village of, well, when I say a village, this more like a city, a city of 50, 52,000 people. And they had been there. They, they had left long enough ago that there was none of them left, which for a large army, four hours is enough for them to db back and, and get the hell out. But short enough that the bodies were still, or the, the carcasses the and the guts were still semi-lukewarm mm -hmm. and were stinking to high hell because it was midday. I, uh, I had guys roll con checks not to throw up. <laughs> not just from the smell, but from the sheer viciousness of the uh, scene. Oh, yeah, I could I could see that. If in a different game, you might have them roll sand. Uh, I'm glad I never took my party through, uh, through Call of Cthulhu. They would have joked all the way to death. <laughs> Which would have probably been like two sessions. For a second, I was like, "Is that joke or choked?" It almost sounded like both. It almost sounded like both. Yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. I'm not. I'm not disputing that. You ran into that one. Mm -hmm. But now, when it comes now, when it comes to forced march, you know, for every for every additional hour of trap. Of travel and adventure makes a con save. Um, the the um thing I can see where they're going with this, but if but the um for in my opinion something like a something like a forced march should have some sort of benefit that makes the risk worth it, other than just extending how far out you go. Yeah. Um. I mean, I definitely see the point that you're going for there. I I don't understand why they're just like, yeah, forced march for additional... You can go out one more hour of thing to test against whether you get a level of fatigue or not. For an untrained troop, that makes sense. Forced march for militaries, well, they also know how to push past fatigue. So that doesn't necessarily apply in the same way. And for... Even the meanest of adventurers, you know, even those who are extremely mean of means, as it were, <clears throat> they still, uh, they still can perform a forced march better than a civilian can. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I don't I don't like the I don't like the the forced march rules here uh having to do with it's essentially yeah, sure you can go beyond your 8 hours in a day, but you're going to suffer because you're going to have to make DC throws at the end of each hour. Cuz you know, a forced march for example, con saving throw at the end of the first extra hour is DC 10 plus 1 because it's 1 hour of additional travel. But you have to test it every hour with an increasing DC at every hour. Um, for higher level characters, this isn't going to be a big issue. Hell, for characters that have a high con to begin with, this isn't going to be a big issue. I'd say even low, even low levels who have who have who um, who ha who have proficiency with con saves are this is going to be a breeze. Yeah. So the, the deficit of fatigue isn't necessarily going to occur for some character types. Mm -hmm. For other character types, they're going to be at a disadvantage all the way up until level 20. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure this is where someone would, ye someone would yell about, about um, balance, but 
I don't think I don't think that I don't think that applies in this kind of thing. Nah. Uh, unless you want to treat your fighter like he's a mount, which um. <laughs> Good luck not getting a sword up the ass. Not a, not every not every but not every duo is going to be freak the mighty. Let's <laughs> just get that out of our system. Uh, but, and so, after the forced march, they have the focus on mounts and pack animals, mm -hmm. which all have their own travel pace. But then it says that mounts can only travel at certain paces for maybe at most an hour a day. Like you can only go at a gallop for an hour a day. It's like I feel like I feel like th I feel like that. It it's a little it's a little too arbitrary for it to be universal. I really I really feel that the amount of the amount of time that they can go each day at gallop speed should vary between animal to animal. Like well, and what if your mount is magical? Well, there's also that. But let's consider say say are you are you trying to say that a a pack horse and a war horse would both would both only be able to do gallop speed for an hour. No, 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 no. That's yeah. It's it's not a very good litmus. That's why if you're go if you're going to have this if you're going to have limited gallop speed when it comes to this kind of thing, it should not be universal. No. Especially since it also there's especially since there are some kind of there are some mounts that I cannot see them doing gallop speed at all like say a boar um or a camel mm -hmm. camels don't exactly gallop the same way horses do and their gallop tends to be slower camels are usually in it for the long haul yeah um well that well that and that and being assholes yeah but then then of course you also have the additional uh, burden of you have to have a separate supply resource for your mounts. I mean, yes, you need to feed your mounts just as much as you need to feed yourself. But many mounts, depending on where you are, can forage. Horses forage all the time. It's not, it's not preferred. Um, you definitely want to have good water and, and good food for your horses if you're taking them on long-distance journeys. That is a thing. But you can, in most regions of the world, except for those where there is very little foliage, uh, have, a, have a horse forage just fine. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't like supply mechanics. <laughs> I just don't. See, then, th then we get to resting and havens. Yeah. So a haven is a place to get to get a meal and a full night's sleep without the risk of attack or harm from the elements. Reasonable risk. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot to talk about that. Let's see. Then we get well, to. Go ahead. There's, there's, there's one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, an inn is considered a haven, but a campsite where you have to keep watch through the night is not. Which is changing the long rest rules entirely at that point. Because a long rest in base 5e states that part of that long rest can be, you know, an out, a, a certain amount of time of that is, is, can be watch duty. And you'll still have your fatigue removed. You'll still have your stress removed as part of that long rest. Mm -hmm. so the, this is the, outright this is bullshit this is imposing an additional restriction on top of the fatigue system and if you if you want to do that as a reflection of your as a reflection of a specific setting like say how heroes of Terra, when i interviewed the dev behind that he had mentioned that um that the t that the time the time for short and long rest is ex is extended to reflect his particular um, style of fantasy in that. Um, mm -hmm. Which, as much as as much as I don't like as much as I don't like the reliance on short and long rest for a bit for class features in Five E, at the very least, extending that time to re to reflect to reflect a to reflect a 
more grounded, more grounded kind of fantasy. Okay, fine. I'm, wi mm -hmm. I'm willing to I'm willing to swallow that pill. Um. But when but when it comes to the whole keeping watch thing, um, I'd imagine that in a lot in a lot of setups, people are gonna ha people are gonna have the question of, well, if I keep watch, does that mean I'm not gonna be able to get my abilities back? Yeah, yeah, that's and and that's the issue I have because base five e this is this is one of the cases where vanilla actually has it better, where no matter what the long rest, no matter what you do during that long rest, so long as you get the restful hours of that long rest, you get the benefits of the long rest, which is you know the the healing, the the redu reduction in your fatigue levels, etc. Mm -hmm. It it. This says no. You have to be in a place where where it's where you're also not at reasonable risk of harm from elements or or anything else. It's like well, in a campsite that you're guarding, that's what you get. And the reason you rotate watch with your party is to make sure everybody gets some restful sleep. Mm -hmm. I just, it's it's crap. In my opinion, it's it's crap. Yeah. So then they go into tracking supplies. With, where where um where it's all it's all consolidated into a single item called supply. When you get access to food and water, you can add supply to your inventory. One supply consists of enough combined food and water to to sustain a medium-sized creature for a day. You can carry a number of supply equal to your strength score, in addition to the rest of your gear. When you take a long rest, you must consume a supply. If you do not, you gain a level of fatigue. I do not understand why this is gated by your strength score. I don't understand why this is even here. Oh. Again, un unless unless you're unless you're really in a really hardcore setting where this tor this sort of supply tracking is necessary, instead of the assumption that, hey, you all made sure to bring along your lembas bread and and flasks of water, right? Yes, I'm using that just to get at you, Monk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the 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 real issue is, unless you are in a wasteland, in some sort of place where fauna and flora are sparse, there is usually an abundance of some sort of food, whether that be roots dug up from the ground, grubs, uh, maybe there's a deer across across the way that your ranger can actually be useful and shoot. Um, any of those, really. The, the, the idea of not having food and water is ludicrous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, adventurers are hardy and resourceful individuals, as implied by the fact that they are called to adventure. These these people are not... They're not your level zero NPC citizens. They're not, you know, I have two HP, I can die to literally anything. Or, you know, if this is 3.0 and you're a wizard, you're weaker than a squirrel, but we won't get into that. <laughs> uh, um, the, these are these are people... Hell, the wizard can cast Magic Missile and kill them a deer. And you're good to go. And Magic Missile is a cantrip! That, no, that always hits. Exactly! There's no miss to Magic Missile! There's your food! Family of deer, now we've got, you know, deer meat for the next... Fucking months, mm -hmm. and they, and that can all be carried by the barbarian at like one percent of his carrying cap. Yeah. Plus, you would you would think that you would think that when it comes to get getting getting supplies out in the wild, this is where the ranger should be able to shine. Exactly, and then of course water is even easier. Create water is a spell. And yeah, where you can create a meter cubed of water. And a meter cubed of water is how many liters? I'd say it's... it I'd say enough to I'd say enough to supply a party of four people. Oh, definitely. And and then some. You'd mm -hmm. be able to fill up your your water skins and everything. Yeah. 
you'd be able to bathe in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, gr- granted, the f- granted, the food from Create Food and the water from Create Water are going to taste like shit, but it's going to keep you alive. It's no different from, say, um, say in Stormlight, when, when soul casting was used to make food, the food tasted like shit, but it was cert- but it was going to keep but it was going to keep you fed. Yes, it had nutritional value, and that's what mattered. Mm-hmm. So, this this is the reason this tracking supplies shit as a general rule, rather than having this in like a sidebar that says, "Hey, optional rules for journeying." Having the havens and the supplies should be optional rules for journeying. For those people who have settings where maybe you you have to be a lot more on your guard at night without creating some sort of magical haven because of some nightly threat that is in and of itself semi-magical and mystical in nature. Mm. So you can't actually sleep. Or uh, maybe finding who, food, food out in the in the wild is hard and you can't uh you can't actually you know uh go ahead and forage of course if you have a druid that doesn't matter good berry yeah <laughs> if good berry still exists in level up 5e uh the supplies thing means nothing literally nothing <laughs> well, given the fact that they still have to be, they still have to be OGL compatible, I'd say, yeah, it's still a thing. So, this this seems like this again makes me think of authors changing and ideas that are being proposed by playtesters, perhaps not being the same as the ideas Level Up 5e had at the beginning. Mm -hmm. This might have been more Grog's complaining. Oh, oh yes, because, because, um, it's, because apparently the only true way to play fantasy is the, is the whole love, is the level one bastards kind of, kind of attitude. Which is, which of course is stupid when it, when there was a, when there was a whole book about immortality back in the day. Where do you think the I in Beck me comes from, you fucks? Yep. Um. Anyway, um. Next, they go into vehicles and de- and dealing with um land and land and water vehicles. Not a whole lot to say. Not a whole lot to say about th- about this. Um. I do. Th- I do think that um. I do think that separating it between land and water vehicles, like, where's the air? Where's my where's my goddamn airships? <laughs> um, where's Ash to be asking that question? Probably, probably building his own airships. Yep, with blackjack and hookers, mm-hmm. or maybe the airship is named Blackjack. Well, there's a mech called a blackjack. <laughs> it's the it's the okayest mech to ever come out of General Motors. <laughs> uh, but unless... essentially, these uh th- these land vehicle issues, I don't have, I, I don't really have any issue with them. But it makes sense that hey, they have to travel at a certain pace, and if you try to go faster than that pace, you can suffer malfunction. That actually makes sense, unless of course you know. It's magical again, but you know, we're I guess we're assuming mundanity here. Yeah. Um Let's see. Let's see. Then we ha then we have regions. And they spend a lot of time trying to talking about the definition of regions. A bit um a bit excessively amount of time. So Yeah, they, they they it's excessive. It boils down to uh, maybe there's a re- there's an area on a map whose description is it fits more than one of the region types they present, and so you can choose either or or combine both. And then they talk about how regions can have tiers, and these tiers are used to describe the 
general difficulty of whatever is contained within them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, tier zero through tier four having to do with the tiers an adventuring party will go through. A tier, a tier. Uh, you know, they they mention offhand that a tier four Feywood could be home to extremely powerful and capricious Fey beings, or might be ruled by an ancient green dragon. So the tiers are, are guidelines with which to the narrator can uh, choose appropriate um, difficulties. Mm -hmm. But then they also, you know, stay, say right at the end of that section that in some games, the narrator may prefer not to designate regions with a default tier and instead present the adventurers with encounters and challenges appropriate for their level. No shit. So, what? <laughs> like, nope. Um, no shit. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, I can see both sides of this coin here. It'd be fun to assign tiers and then have your uh, low-level party accidentally blunder into the, the nest of, a, of an arch lich or something. You're in a tier four wasteland ruled by an archlich. You might want to get the fuck out. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you'll indicate that with the crackling thunder in the distance that is a color to sinister purple, and the fact that literally everything in this place is goddamn dead. Run the hell away! And it never seems to ha the sun never seems to be out. It's perpetually overcast. Oh yeah, and uh, you haven't seen a living creature for days, guys. For days. You know where the road is. You scouted. The road's literally half a mile east. Go east. And this is where your your low level party encounters TPK because they're stupid. But I digress. Mm -hmm. Um. Now we'll I can. Go ahead. I can see that being fun. Mm -hmm. It's just like when you accidentally go to the Death Claw nest too early in the game. Yeah. The th the vibe the vibe that I'm getting is um. To, is the question of to hex crawl or not to hex crawl? Because a lot of a lot of what they're putting in here would be just would be could be easily solved with just saying, okay, th okay, these are the rules that you that can be used if you want to do hex crawl like play. You you have an optional sidebar for hey, if you want this type of play, here they are. Um, I mean, I I see here like they mentioned weather. It's like, okay, yeah, you roll for weather, and maybe you get something extreme that then becomes some sort of encounter. But it's fucking weather. More often than not, a, a, a storyteller of some sort, the narrator, whatever, is going to make up the weather on the fly for how they believe is going to... Uh, what, what they believe is going to be most... Uh, most impactful for whatever scene they're creating mm -hmm. um and then of course we discover we or we discuss the encounters in a little more detail yeah and i say a little more because it talks about tables you can't roll on because they don't actually exist because they're in other sections of the book that don't exist yet mm -hmm. um and I... then of course oh go ahead um I do, th I do think that they should have given more than just a pittance to the four pill, to the four categories of encounters are effectively supposed to be the their pillars of the of the of their encounter system, mm -hmm. and maybe it's maybe it's further into maybe it's I doubt it's further into the document, and if it is, I if it is, I take I take this back, but. I do th I do think some I do think some further definition on what some of these encounter types are should have been put into here especially when it, especially when it comes to social encounters and scenery Social encounters and scenery I didn't really see anything for unless they're counting the next section journey activities as part of those I would I would not Yeah because these are supposed to be the four ca these are supposed to be the four categories. So, ideally, you ideally this would be the time where you'd ex where you'd explain what it is and get and give 
give give a few examples and get and give a few of if you want uh give a concrete idea on what sort on what sort of encounters that someone might have in their head narratively would translate to one of these four pillars yeah the the first two i say are somewhat self-explanatory exploration challenges especially with the the examples they gave in the glossary earlier things that occur in the areas you're exploring that make it hard to traverse or are present in traversing in some fashion mm -hmm. uh, their examples were a broken bridge or a tornado yeah um and you can expand upon that monsters i feel is 100 percent self-explanatory it's time for a battle or uh, as 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 um as a once famous uh man wearing leather pants said it's time to oh grandpa has a stroke i'm sorry <clears throat> fuck you uh... man <laughs> <laughs> but the social encounters is that just going to be any any like oh there's a merchant that you're passing and they're trying to sell you their wares is that going to be Oh, you happen to overhear some people walking on the road talking about, um, you know, events happening that they know of that you don't. Is it, what is that going to be? And then what is scenery? Is scene, a scenery encounter just going to be like, oh yeah, you found a really nice lake and you guys stayed by it for a little while because it was pretty. Is this going to be like those vantage point things that we always see in Assassin's Creed games? Jesus Christ, I hope not. <laughs> To understand more about the region, climb that cliff that is a uh, very, very ostentatiously marked with paint. I think the paint means those are the places you can grab the ledges, guys. Go for it. You know, at the very, at the very least, when sh at the very least, the t the towers that you had to s that you had to strike with the hammer in. Um... Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War made a little bit more sense. Yeah, just a bit, a little bit. Um, I, 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 uh, I personally think what Ubisoft did with their their tower system in I Immortals: Phoenix Rising was the best. There were only four in the entire game, hmm. and they revealed a hu well. No, there's no. Oh, excuse me. There are six in the entire game. Four of them in the it are are very prominent one of them is less prominent because you don't know to go there until way late into the game and the last one you don't even have to get to finish the game but you can get if you want to continue to explore the area mm -hmm. and th those are four giant fucking statues of each of the gods in their own regions so you're scaling the statues of gods to then survey the god's domain makes perfect sense um, the fifth one is a picture of Zeus holding, or is a statue of Zeus holding an eagle, which is on the side of a mountain. Um, and then, and then the final one is the demonic face of Typhon on the front of a mountain, where Typhon has made his lair. So, yeah, and they all make perfect sense. And considering that Immortal Phoenix Rising lets you scale literally everything, uh, Breath of the Wild style, um, not only is it fun. You don't get the painted legends issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's a. Uh, I think that's also the least amount of towers I've ever had to scale in an Ubisoft game ever. <laughs> um, regardless, I don't know how the scenery is going to work at all. That word can mean anything when it comes to. A scene. Is it a picturesque area that you're in? Is there a specific event happening in the scene that you're being hinted to pay attention to? What is it that is scenery? Mm -hmm. uh, and that chill feeling might be mere scenery. But it might be the sign of some kind of undead spirit. Or it might foreshadow a weather event. What? And 
when it comes now when it comes to when it comes to journey activities um like the so so as i get so as i get this it goes an adventure can make one journey activity check per region only one party member can undertake a given journey activity why yeah why well, can't multiple party members busk or scout i don't mm -hmm. get that Let's see. Then we have the DC based on the tier. If tier is supposed to be optional, why is D why does it seem not so when it comes to the DC? Um, let's see. Then we, ha we have experienced travelers. The busk and rob journey activities are most profitable for novice, but experienced ones can sometimes pick them pick out a mark carrying confidential materials instead of go instead of gold. And nobles seek out performers. Um. See, then we have the modifying DC. So the options we are: befriend animal, busk, chronicle, cook, cover tracks, entertain, gather components, gossip, and harvest. Oh, there's a few more: there's hunt, us. gather, prey, rob, scout, and track. So there's a there's a respectable variety of actions, but again, I have I have to ask: why is it that why is it that this has to be a with some, okay, for 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 starters, one of the questions that I have to ask is, why why does this have to be rolled? For starters. Secondly, why is it one adventurer per action? I don't I don't see a legit I don't see a legitimate reason why th why this can't be a collab. Like let's say. Let's say you ha let's say you do have two let's say you have a cleric and a paladin of the same faith. Why can't both of them do the prey action? Or hell, not even not even that. What if the what if you're um I remember I remember I remember when I was in that short-lived um Ravenloft campaign with with Nurgle with Nurgle and company. And mm -hmm. We were all we were all pe we were all people we were all from the same religious order coming back from a crusade, uh -huh. and you're gonna tell me that all, that all of them, um, that of them only one of them could do the prey action. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um. It. it I think it has to do partly with the fact that they wrote every one of these actions for a singular person. And truth be t truth be told, with some of these, with maybe it's just me, but I feel like with these, with this action list, um, some of some of these should be should very much be leaning towards cer towards certain classes. Like say, chronicle is so chronicle is something that should be that. Should, that should play a factor if you're doing chronicle as say a bard or a ranger versus other classes. Um, whereas busk should very should very much be um, leaning towards bards, or the very yeah. least people. With, uh, it it doesn't even have to be um doesn't even have to be class. It could just as well be background. Um, or someone that just has the skill performance, yeah, has has prefer has a has a proficiency in it, yeah. But I th I think that I think this kind of thing is a ca is a case of um di of disunification um when it comes to mechanics. Well, and these these mechanics feel like they again the, the, like I said at the beginning of this this doesn't feel like exploration. It feels, honestly, it, it feels like the Oregon Trail. Which, That's what this is reminding me of, the Oregon Trail. Which, while a fun and hilarious game on its own right, is not an exploration game. It is an endurance game. No, it it it, it very much so. There's there's a reason there's a reason why why the, why those sort why stories of those sorts of travels. Result resulted in the phrase "the forlorn hope" being a thing. Oh, sorry, uh, monk. Uh, you're gonna have to stop now. It looks like you died of dysentery. <laughs> <laughs>
Ha! Never heard that one before. Of course not. I am completely original, 100% of the time. Although, I ha I have, although the uh, I've, I may end I may end up coming up with a meme of, of um, Oregon Trail, I sleep, Amazon Trail, real shit. <laughs> uh, that's bad. Oh, it's ba it's bad, but um. Amazon Trail, in in some ways, is was far more interesting, even if it involved time travel when going down the river. Let's uh, let's not travel through time right now. You also had That's to deal with the you also had to deal with the risk of piranhas when doing the fishing mini game. Yep, I know. Oh. But uh, like like I said, all of these actions are they they feel like. Pick these actions to do on this leg of the journey, mm. rather than you're exploring, you're performing scut work. Yeah, and there's at the end of this, there's going to be a couple of games I'm going to be using for comparison's um, sake. Um, mm -hmm. You can pro you can probably guess one of them because, and actually both both of them are games that I've previously reviewed. So okay. So keep so keep that keep that in mind with what with what comes. But after that, they do a short they do a short list of the of the regions that in, that um includes include includes um tiers the the a weather um chart and and journey activities. So it seems that the it seems that the idea that they're going with is that the um, is that the the preferred the preferred journey activities are going to be region focused instead of character focused which, which just I, makes my comparison to the Oregon Trail even more to which i say why for what reason can you not have both actually if, especially especially since especially since you dis, you boasted about an entire pillar based based on exploration throughout all of the classes called the fucking exploration nax In addition, why can't you busk in the in the Badlands? Why not? Mm -hmm. I am sure that there might be someone out there willing to listen and give you coin. Nomads are nomads are a thing. They are, but I don't know what the Aldecaldos have to do with this. <laughs> um, let's see, then then we have we have Country Shire, which is exactly what you think it would be. Um, hey, hobbits are there. Let's go visit. Let's see, uh, when I say hobbits are there, the, the there's a note about Haven for the country shire that says the entire region is a haven. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Um, given how the given how the mere the mere mention Gandalf mere, merely mentioning um, that he was that he mere mentioning adventure. Was en was enough to was enough to make every house within earshot of the Shire clo close all their doors and close all their windows. Yep. And you're and you're telling and you're telling me that the entire that the entire uh, that the entire Shire would be would be considered a haven. No, it w no it wouldn't. They don't like they don't like adve they don't like adventurers or or much in the way of outsiders. That kind of shit makes you late for dinner. Yep. Bilbo and Frodo were just weird motherfuckers with bad genetics. <laughs> let's not let's not forget the old song about 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 the things that Bilbo Baggins hates. Yep, and, and let's not forget the fact that the only reason Sam went on the Lord of the Rings travels was for Frodo. Yeah, he was a good friend, but every step of the way. Sam had thoughts about how much he fucking missed the Shire and wanted to go kiss that pretty girl on the lips. Which he eventually did, and then had kids. At least that's implied. I'd I'd say I'd say I'd say given the kind of given the kind of story that was that that was going for, it's it's what ended up happening. Um, for him, it's yeah. The, it's the it's the class it's the classical coming back from coming back from the war and ki and kissing the girl kind of thing. Which you know, considering that uh, 
Tolkien went through the psalm. Um, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we digress. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit rails there. It's a little bit rails, but I but I needed to wash. I needed to wash the the Tol- the Tolkien unsociety stink out of my mouth. Yeah, they um. It's a good thing that the estate of Tolkien controls Tolkien's properties. Let's just leave it that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Tolkien Society can suck a dick, and they probably would. And they like it because it's progressive. <laughs> Especially if it's a woman's penis. <laughs> oh, <laughs> any, anyway. The Fay. Let's see, then we have the Feywood, which... Ha- which gives a expertise die on stealth checks to the entire adventurers. Um, I have <laughs> I have several issues with that. Since once again, Faye aren't, Faye aren't exactly what I would call neighborly. Or what about the fact that uh, in, during their journey activities, if they're using hunt and gather, they roll with advantage. If you're hunting in a Feywood... Good luck when uh, Titania and Oberon find that you've killed one of their deer. Because uh, much like ancient, much like the uh, the kings in the Middle Ages, Titania and Oberon like what's theirs. They don't like when people take what's theirs. Good job. Let's not forget that even taking a even taking a branch. Um, from a from a Feywood is enough to start a fight. Depending on the Feywood, this is true. Mm-hmm. My favorite example of a Feywood would be the Lost Woods. Yeah, um, there's also the whole thing of when it when an adventurer breaks a promise made in a, made in a Feywood, they suffer a level of strife. That's the only part in this I'm willing to put up with. Wait, wait, wait what? Fey promises. When an adventurer breaks a promise made in the Fey, would they suffer a level of strife? Okay. That's actually a nice narrative hook. That's pretty fucking cool. You don't think much about the promises you make with your party or with NPCs. I've seen PCs break promises they made unless they knew it would severely negatively affect things willy-nilly constantly it's just a thing if you can get away with breaking an arbitrary promise and there's no harm and you still get benefits you'll do it i'm reminded of the anima abilities that eclipse cast solars had yeah um see then we have fiery hellscape um weather uncomfortably warm no shit so this is Mordor. For anyone who's been keeping track of the Tolkienisms, this is act- actually Mordor. Yeah. Um, twice. Well, this is actually this is probably the region around Mount Doom, whereas yeah. blasted uh, the the blasted uh, Badlands would probably be the rest of Mordor. Mm-hmm. Let's see, unquenchable thirst. Um, journey activities. One. Some of the journey activities made at say made at disadvantage I can understand, but the big the big burr up my ass has has always been why um why why modifiers to journey activities have to be exclusive to the region. I don't see an, I don't see enough of a reason why why they can't why they can't why they can't be integrated into background or cl- or class or even race in some cases. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure someone in the distance is gonna say, "Don't you mean ancestry? No, race." Look, no matter how much you no matter how much you try and you try and argue otherwise, it's been grandfathered in for the past forty years. Deal with it. Um. But then we get to Frozen Waste, also known as my ha- my hometown. And Let's see. Um. Let's see then we ha- we have weather we the weather is about what i'd expect the tears are about what i'd expect Let's see then it goes to chilly without the proper gear or magic to survive the cold temperatures an adventurer suffers a level of fatigue when taking a long rest in this environment even if you have supply so if you don't have your mummy bag 
and your tent, mm -hmm. you freeze to death. No shit. Holy fuck. I never would have guessed. Let's see. Journey, journey activities. Gain, gain advantage to survival checks ma made to find a target using tracks left in the snow. Tr tracks made to hide. Made to hide tracks have this disadvantage. Why? Why is this not involved? Why is this not involving the ranger? Additionally, why is it that checks made to hide tracks have disadvantage? I've hidden my tracks in the snow by literally dragging branches behind me. It's a. That's... It's one. Of, it's one of those. It's one of those tricks that we that that we've known about for, for since we were kids. It's a trick that the human race has known about since as long as humans have been living in snow. Mm -hmm. This is this is not this is not new technology. This is not fancy finagled shit. Hold a branch behind your ass as you walk. So long as you don't, you know, make a really wide stance or have a really narrow branch. Like, if you grab a fan of pine needles and just, like, tie it to your back belt loop, you're good. Mm -hmm. Weigh it down a little, maybe. Yeah. Um, then, we get to ha then we get to Haunted Lands, also, also known as Detroit. Are you sure Detroit isn't just a blasted Badlands? I could go either way. See. It's both. It's it's one of the hybrid regions that they were talking about earlier. Yep. Settlements that have suffered a curse or areas that are home to undead. Um, Light sources only illuminate half the area. And you get a level of strife when sleeping if you can't pass a wisdom save. What the fuck? And prey and entertain are made with disadvantage. But what if the guy... Why would... What if the god you're what if you're praying to the Raven Queen? What if you're praying to invoking an old name? Weejoss, goddess of death. Mm -hmm. Um or alternatively, what if you're a uh, a paladin of, of any of the numerous gods of light and you're praying to clear the darkness? I wouldn't see that being as made with disadvantage. I'd see that as a contested role at that point. Yeah. But what would you what would you contest at that point? Yeah, uh, tr trying to have trying to have some of these be be, res be resolved in just a sentence when it's supposed to be out, when it's supposed to cover as much ground as a region is said to feels feels a little bit um half-assed. Yeah. See, then we have lofty mountains, not to be confused with misty mountains. Yeah. So, Scotland. I mean, you're not wrong, mm -hmm. especially since it's climbable and gives you an expertise die on checks made to climb. Wait a minute. We've intermixed expertise die and advantage disadvantage. God fucking damn it. Choose one or the other. Pick a lane and stick pick a lane and stick to it. Um, and then high altitude for the thin air bullshit. Yeah, and to be quite honest, that's one of those things that's going to be way too fiddly for a lot of people. They'll just wave it and not even care. Or if I absolutely had to do if I absolutely had to do high altitude, I'd prob I probably I probably just ha I'd probably just utilize the fatigue system. Yeah. Um. Because all that all because it's just going to be another means of of slowing you of slowing you down. Um, yeah. Let's see, op open roads, pretty self pretty self explanatory that pretty self explanatory there. Parched sands. Um. Once again, once again, self explanatory. Once again, self explanatory. Um. The only the o there's only one response I have to parched sands. Do 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 do. Yes, the the Gerudo Desert theme. It's a good song. It's a good song, but 
I'm just I am di I am disappointed. You should not be. It doesn't even make sense to be disappointed over the Gerudo Desert theme. I'm disappointed. <laughs> I'm disappointed at your attempt at scatting. No, that wasn't scatting. That was me imitating the uh, um the the uh the 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 clapping percussion at the beginning of the Gerudo Desert. Mm -hmm. So it's not scatting. It's just me going chaka 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 because that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Um, let's see, restless seed. Not not a whole lot to say. Not a whole lot to say on that. On that. Um. Let's see, rolling. It's it's, yeah. it's just a C yep. that's very very choppy. Yep, rolling rolling grasslands. Um, once again, not once again, not a whole not a whole lot to see that I haven't already said. Urban t urban township. Um, sh how why. Sh why would a city be considered a region? Isn't a city wouldn't a city be too small to be considered that? I guess. I mean, let's maybe urban township is for things like Gondor. Gondor can be considered its own fucking region considering how large that goddamn city is. Yeah, but they but they say from mighty sprawling cities to smaller bustling towns. Allow me to imitate the taunt of a character from Super Smash Brothers in response. <laughs> uh, DK, your taunts are the best. But I don't know why they are saying cities to tiny villages. And... <sighs> This is only a sample of region types and exploration stuff and all that fun. Mm -hmm. I am, I am Jack's underwhelmed face. Yeah. Um. Let's see, underland realm is what is what what is what one would expect. Um, unrelent unrelenting marsh. It's a fucking swamp. You never, and you don't build a castle in a swamp. Artax, no! <laughs> it even has, it even has a part for that. Hard to hoof. Mounts and pack animals are unable to travel at a fast pace or gallop pace. Additionally, wheeled vehicles cannot travel faster than a crawl. It's the swamp of despair, you motherfuckers. And if none of you cried at that part, I'm calling you liars or soulless. Leave the gingers out of this. I discriminate against no one, monk. All shall be called out for their soullessness. <laughs> See, and then war torn kingdom and occup, which I don't. I don't understand. Um, how how war torn kingdom counts as a region is some is something that is odd to me. War torn kingdom seems like an event. Yeah. Maybe it, it means something like uh, to use an example from Final Fantasy VI, the Gestalian Empire. They're at war with other people, and they've got civil unrest within. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Then we have this. Then we have this image of a some of a semi or of a semi organic kind of dungeon. I'm like, this is awesome. There's... Why isn't this one 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 of the region ideas? Do you see the person in the wall on the left? Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. It's like, I think this is a terrain feature. Mm -hmm. See, then we have the whole putting it putting it all together. They've mentioned exploration challenges before. And now they ha now they have a bunch of a bunch of um terrain s terrain setups, um, as well like as an the acid field, mm -hmm. as well as the challenge rating, the am the amount of ex the XP, the DC of the of the places. 
and the air the area along with encounter ta and along with encounter tables um they only show two and and i had two encounter what is this so as a point as a point of comparison when it comes to when it comes to this silliness oh wait hold on Hold on. Here's a little bit more definition behind what they meant by social encounters and scenery. Social encounters. Some regions have a higher proportion of social encounters. These are short little hooks for the narrator to use. Perhaps they encounter a knight looking for her lost love. Or a merchant selling a brand new potion. I was right! Social encounters are passers-by on the fucking way! God damn it! That's lazy! And then, scenery. The narrator is furnished with a wide array of scenery, which can be used to simply add flavor to a region. A stone circle. An empty windmill. A tree decorated with humanoid skulls. Of course, the players don't know if that's just scenery or a monster sign, or some type of exploration challenge. They might spend 20 minutes discussing that oddly placed hilltop graveyard. I was right on both counts. I skimmed this document, didn't even get to this part. Like, I, I got to, like, the top of regions, like, okay, I think I'm pretty much ready for this episode. Mm -hmm. I didn't even get to this part, and I guessed what their social encounters and scenery were. It's exactly what I thought. Social encounters are some motherfuckers you're passing during journeying, doing something for you to interact with socially. And scenery is, oh, that lake looks pretty nice. At least you guys could go, see that really shiny lake? It's really, really shiny, but nothing's drinking from it. Mm -hmm. It is at this moment that you realize the lake is made of mercury. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. But the point the point is, the fact that I came up with those things off the cuff, half not caring, and it's exactly what it is? This is lazy, EN World. This is lazy. Y yes, th some of the social encounters should obviously be something to do with passersby. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. But... Are there no deeper social encounters? Is there no level, no spectrum to the social encounters, just like the way you've had a spectrum of tiers of stuff with each of your regions? Where is the variety? Well, that's up to the narrator to decide. Okay, but you've still basically only given them one prompt, and that prompt is some sort of passerby. Mm -hmm. now, and while narrators like myself or the monk or any of our other brothers that have joined us on this uh, this program and others may have the, the writing wherewithal to expand from just that one prompt into things unexpected and unknown, not every narrator is going to have that, that particular skill set. They may be new or they may rely a little more heavily on books because that's just part of how they work not nothing wrong with it different skill sets yeah now with, I, go ahead i was just gonna say without more prompts and especially the scenery but the scenery is one of four different things you can encounter this this scratch the scenery fucking throw it out and that's and just say hey by the way as you're uh as you're your people are traveling through the regions describe cool little things that are popping up here and there mm -hmm. maybe there's an empty windmill because you're in a war-torn kingdom and the people could no longer stay there due to all of the civil warring or maybe there's a tree full of skulls because at one point there was a death cult here and there still might be a death cult here who knows make it up the sky is the limit and sometimes not even then Sorry to cut you off so many times. No, but go ahead. No, wor no worries. Um, 
But I I wanted to use I wanted to use two games as a as a point as a point of as a point of my beloved comparison. Now, as I mentioned before, both of these games are games that I've reviewed. Yes. Um, the first one that I'm that I'm covering this is, in my opinion, in my opinion, the best, um, the best game to use the Tolkien license, that being the One Ring. Now, for this point of comparison, I'm using First Edition because, while I have the beta documents for, um, Second Edition as a backer, um, I don't feel comfortable using that using that for this for obvious reasons, so I'm using the First yeah. Edition. And yeah, um, the, Tol- the Tolkien estate could, for whatever reason, be assholes about you talking about beta documents in too much detail. Um, it's it's more it's more just it's more just general principle. I don't I don't I don't like um, putting that comparison with something that's that might not even be finished yet. Yeah, that too. That makes sense. So, I in, I ended up going into my copy of the of the One Ring First Edition and digging up the journey um, mechanic that they had for it, which incidentally is one of my favorite um, systems when it comes to this level of travel. So okay, the first thing that the first thing that the party has to do, or the company as it's referred to in the game, is to is to set a route. I.e., you guys are you're trying to reach a specific destination and you're using the using the map to determine the road to determine the road you're going to follow. Um, yeah. Since you do have a, a unified map, as this is the middle the the it's Middle Earth, mm-hmm. so you can see places like the Shire and Gondor and the, the like, the different woods and mountains and Mordor and all these other places. Yeah. So you know where you're going. Mm-hmm. Um. And of course, of course, of course, the map is the map is color coded by different um, terrain difficulties. Okay, which co- makes which sense. Will mo- and then then comes distance, where you'd me- where you'd measure the amount of hexes that you're going to be traveling, with one hex equaling ten miles, um, including the hex containing the destination, but not the one containing the starting point. Okay. Um, so, if you're go- if you're walking along the southern eaves, let's let's say that would the distance between the two landmarks that you're going to might be 15 hexes, so 150 miles. Okay. Um. And the and of co- then when it co- and when it comes to terrain, um. The the um, the terrain that you're going on may modify the amount of miles that you're traveling. So, say, a a good road might cut might cut the amount of miles and might cut the amount of mileage total mileage in half. Whereas, so, whereas things like wood and desert might multiply it by by up by um five. Uh huh. Um. The next the next thing is of course speed. Whether you tr- are you traveling on foot, are you riding horses, or using boats. Um, and th- then is, um, f- then is fatigue, is fatigue tests, um, which is the, which, the, det- which is determined by the difficulty and also depending on the season, you may have to do a fatigue test more or less often. In winter, you'd have to do it every three days, whereas in summer, you'd only have to do it every six days. Mm-hmm. And... And um, when it, and whenever whenever you're rolling a, whenever you're rolling fat, um a, a fatigue test, if someone rolls the Eye of Sauron, which which would be a one on a on the D twelve, um, that would produce the potential for a hazard. That's rolled, and it could and it could and it could be it could be something as simple as some interesting thing happens or in or full on encounters. The the um uh, the other thing is to the other thing to note with this setup is a kind of ro- is a kind of role system that you have where there are four major roles that that the party can take and multiple people can take it the guide the scout the huntsman and the lookout man okay and and 
hang on, I need to, I need to, I need to um, switch books because it's one of those things that splits. And some of this was in the lore master's book, basically the GMs, and some of it wasn't. Um, so let me, and this is this is why having an index is always important. But the, so let me see. Let's see here. Okay, 152. Actually, what am I? And. So just a bit, just a bit of flip, just a bit of flipping about. And obviously, obviously, I'm not going to be co I'm not going to be covering every little detail with this, but just, to, but just the, um, just the ba just the baseline when it come when it comes to this kind of thing. Um. Gu guides, self-explanatory. They're the they're the ones who are who are. Who are so it says the guide of the company is responsible for decisions such as when the group should stop for a rest or how to manage their reserves of food. Sc a sc a scout can be called upon to find a suitable location for setting up camp or when the situation forces the company to abandon the road it was following to find a new one. Hunts a huntsman is f is basically for um for help for scouting out provisions. And look, lookout men is for is for is um is a, is said is a vital duty that often puts a hero in the position of saving the lives of all members of a group, or dooming them all through inattention. Each of them are each of them are tied to a specific are tied to a spe each of these roles are tied to a specific skill. Um. But the <laughs> but because of because of that because of the particular setup that that, that it has there, the uh -huh. amount the amount of di the amount of distance does matter because the total mileage is going to be is going to be divided in in um in in segments. Each of them is going to be the equivalent of a day. It's just how many. It's just you have a budget of a certain amount of miles and how many how many you're taking off of that each day for for that part of the journey. So so in that in that kind of in that kind of situation mileage actually does matter, but it matters because it's because of proper abstraction. Um and gr granted that granted it has the advantage of already have of already having a setting. So let's bring in um good old good old fantasy craft. A game that does not ha that does not have a setting, and in fact has so has so little of a setting that it's t that it's designed around not having a setting. Have I said setting enough? But let's see here. Ah, yes, man. Managing downtime. All the way in, all the way in the tail end, which sounds like it would be towards, which sounds like it wouldn't be considered all that much, but that's because there's a whole lot of other stuff to consider in just the core book. But let's see, helping your style. Let's see where is. Let's see, Tr manage managing downtime. So one of the big one of the big downtime things is tra is travel. Vehicles have set travel speeds, while ma while mounts and characters have travel speeds in miles per hour equal to one tenth their speed. Travel speeds are modified by terrain and by terrain and weather. Um, and of course, terrain can ha will have a specific check for check DC for survival. Yep. And th and then having um then ha then having a option for random encounters based on based on based on region. 
and they get they gave they give a bit of a few tables so so say a so for what the adversary might be for aquatic terrain for arctic for mountains etc and of course and, and of course the possibility of of encounter conditions um one final note of comparison if you don't mind me bringing up vidya is um is pathfinder kingmaker wherein you have you have you can you can assign mul when you make camp when traveling you can assign oh. multiple roles to to the to your party members whether it whether it be cooking whether it be whether it be lookout or or something else obviously some cl some characters and the like are going to be better at at certain things you wouldn't you wouldn't have a barbarian on cooking duty for instance and of course, of course, of course, cooking can result can result in buffs. But the the point is, um, yet yeah, is that the is that when setting when setting up camp, the the composition of your party actually matters. The a lot of the reason why I bring up these kind of things is to show that this is that it is possible to make to make journeying interesting without making it so divorced as it is here hmm. certainly seems a little more robust it's it most cer it most certainly is um and when it and when it comes to and when it comes when it comes to when it comes to these setups that that are here there's a couple there's a couple major questions i have with the journey system one why is why is it that this feels so divorced from from a lot of the stuff we've seen up to this point especially when it comes to exploration next i think a lot of the exploration next that we've seen don't even reference some of the stuff we've seen in this journeys chapter If they wanted this to be an optional rule set, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I'd I'd rather I'd rather it be fully integrated, but I do I do feel that exploration next should tie back into the into this journey system, especially for some classes more than others. Like for the ranger, not to not to have a whole lot tying into this journey mechanic is inexcusable. For say a warlock, eh. I'm willing. I'm willing to go with that a, l a little bit, but not by much. Uh -huh. But journeying is supposed to be one of the one of the major pillars, and this doesn't feel like it is a major pillar. It feels like an. It feels like a optional rule set. If you're gonna have it be a major pillar of your design, make it so. Um. But you had you had said that this didn't feel like journeying, and I wanted to hold off on that until we get until we got further in. So I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious what your reasoning was for saying that. So, when it comes to a journey, whether it's the hero's journey or a more simple adventure, as many people did when they were children on in parks or on pieces of property, it, there's a sense of the unexpected. And as such, there are things in there, events that are spontaneous and random. And while this tries to do that, they're very formulaic. So, in the end, everything about this exploration system feels very shallow and generic. The choices given to you on what to perform are like a task list that you would do at the leg of the journey rather than true exploration. If there were more depth to this exploration system, 
Uh, they would they would refer to the exploration knacks more often for one. The exploration knacks feel even more tacked on than they already were now. And for two, they would give you a system for unexpected, um, unexpected types of of sub exploration encounter. For example, your guys go through a place that might have a graveyard on it, but under that graveyard might be like a larger uh, underdark city or something. And that's a that's a discovery. That's something they've made, and they'll have to adventure into the underdark and explore the underdark. And there's no there's no allowance for that here. They expect that you're going to go to a known destination of some sort. So it, it doesn't, it feels, the best word is it feels unfinished. Oh. I mean, I know the whole thing is technically unfinished, but like the system itself feels half-baked. Undercooked? Yeah. Oh. I can, I can certainly, I can certainly see that. Oh. In addition, they have some system additions that just would be better served in a sidebar that says here are some optional rules for different types of play. Mm -hmm. So. But that bring, that brings us to the other half of what I wanted to discuss tonight, which is capstones. Now, a capstone is essentially the ability, the, uh, the uber ability that you're supposed to be getting as your reward for being dedicated to that single class for 20 levels. Um, in Pathfinder, this was called the Dedication Bonus. And they've said that they wanted their capstone class features to be something special, not an iteration of a previous ability, not a numerical improvement in something you can already do. Something new, something special, something to strive for, something big. And I, br I quoted that particular thing from, the from their page verbatim because that's our benchmark. That is what that is what they're that is what they're trying to sh that is what they're trying to shoot for. So uh huh, and uh, and they fail with their first uh, first entry. So the first one that we the first one that we have is two ab is two abilities for the adept: perfection achieved and perfect strike. Perfection achieved is. Anytime you roll your martial arts die, you may spend one exertion to roll a d12 instead. If you roll a 12 on this die, you can you can roll another d12 and add it to the result. That is a legitimate, it's legitimately a failure compared to what that 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 said. It's a numerical improvement in something you can already do. That's literally what perfection achieved is. Yeah, and. One in twelve. Let me scoot. So you have so you have a eight point three percent chance of explo of exploding dice, and that martial arts die you're gonna be roll you're gonna be rolling that. This idea you're gonna be rolling that you're gonna be rolling that as your as your um, attacks regardless. Mm -hmm. Um. Since it's basically your your replacement for doing unarmed damage. Yes. Now, as far as far as the whole thing of spent of spending exertion, why would I spend it for that when I can get far more interesting things from whatever maneuvers I've picked? Yeah. Uh, the second one is perfect strike. You and actually, you know, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna put in a th I'm gonna put in a thing a um thing in no in notepad and we'll and I'll be putting a plus and minus for each class and then we'll tr then we'll track it at the end of it so adept and this is going to be an overall plus and minus for these capstones yeah so perfect strike when you hit another creature with a melee weapon attack you may spend 5 exertion to perform a perfect strike your attack becomes a critical hit that deals maximum damage. In addition, the target makes a constitution saving throw or is knocked unconscious for one minute. So this isn't anything that, that, that the monk can do outright by itself. Mm -hmm. But it's also 
not that big, especially with a cost of five exertion. At level tw at level twenty. Yeah. Even then, five exertion seems rather expensive to me. And let let me let me refresh let me refresh um let me refresh the whole thing with with exertion. So you're going to you your exertion pool is tw is twice your proficiency bonus. And since proficiency and is universal across the board, um, so at twentieth level you're supposed to, you're going to have twelve exertion points. Five of that is steep as hell, especially again, you can achieve better effects by combining maneuvers, mm -hmm. and maneuvers cost less. Now, giving giving yourself giving yourself a free a free critical is not is not as interesting as I'm pretty sure they'd like simply because of the fact that, um, unless I'm unless I'm mistaken, they went back to the whole you do a critical you do du you do double damage, which is just a, it actually no what I keep this is one of those things where I keep getting confused because Pathfinder second doubled the dice. Whereas D whereas D and D doubled the total damage after a confirmation. I can't rec and because of how there's been these little changes over the years, I can't recall if five E um did the did the did did the five confirmation or not. Five E does not do a confirmation, but what five E does have you do is roll the damage dice a second time, combine the results of two ro of both rolls, and then add whatever uh, damage modifier you had only once. So for example, mm -hmm. If you rolled to hit with a D with a, a a D8 short sword, and you got a critical, it'd be one D. You'd normally just roll one D8 plus strength mod, but now you roll one D8, or now you roll two D8 plus strength mod. Some people tried to do say plus two times strength mod, but that was wrong. It's it's. 1d8, and then 1d8 again, and then your strength mod on top of that. So what this does is, for example, you could, if you really wanted to, use this to spend one exertion to roll a d12, but then just say you're going to spend five exertion to do maximum damage. And so you, you a critical hit that does maximum damage. So you do 2d12 plus your strength and or dex mod, depending on what you choose to do as a monk. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, I mean adept. Because it's totally not a monk, guys. Um, and that six exertion, half your entire pool, to do 30-ish damage, which is not a lot at level 20. It's bad. Both are bad. And they should feel bad. So I, I I I I I if Ash were here, these would both be in red. Yeah. So so what are you are we so when it comes to the adept, are we giving a are we giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down for its capstone? It, definitely a thumbs down. This is a minus. All right. So ne next, those are underwhelming and terrible, is what yeah. they are. Next is Bard, who only has one ability: epic performance. As an action, you may expend a use of Bardic Inspiration to start an epic performance that lasts for 1d4 rounds. During that time, you can choose up to 50 creatures that are within 120 feet of you. Each creature able to, able to hear or see your epic performance makes a charisma save against your Bard spell save DC. If a creature fails this save, it is charmed by you for the duration plus 6 days or until you or your companions do anything harmful to it. A charmed creature regards you as a friendly acquaintance. The performance ends early if you are incapacitated or silenced, or you voluntarily end it. No action required. At the end of the duration, you expend an additional use of bardic inspiration to extend the duration by 1d4 rounds. When your epic you can perform choose to. Yeah, you can choose to. When your epic performance lasts at least a minute, at the end of the duration, you can target each charmed creature as, as if using the mass suggestion spell cast at ninth level. Creatures Jesus. do not make saving throws to resist this effect. The commands you get you give a charmed creature are not obvious to other creatures, 
who must make a wisdom insight check opposed by your charisma performance check to understand that you're doing anything more than a performance. You can give each creature its own set of commands, but, on, but can only give out six different sets of commands. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. This being once per long rest, I'm willing to I'm willing to buy. But there's one little problem that I have. Spending bardic exp inspiration. Spending multiple uses of bardic inspiration. Minimum of three. Yeah, because um, because rounds are five are five seconds instead of six now, so it has to be twelve rounds to equal a, a single minute to get the mass suggestion effect. Yeah, you're you're expecting you're expect. And that's and that's assuming that you actually managed to roll nothing but fours. Like I said, minimum of three. <laughs> and that is that is a little bit too that is a little bit too RNG RNG ish um, for that whole lasting a minute. I on, I honestly would have would have it that the mass suggestion is if somebody botches. If if they botch their 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 saving throw against your DC. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. Um, it's a neat idea. It's both a cool narrative hook and a cool mechanical hook. Um, I, I don't like the RNG stuff. This this would definitely be yellow. But overall, I say it, it, it deserves a plus. Yes. For the effort, at the very least. It needs a little bit of... A little bit of errata oh, isn't, sure. isn't, bad, isn't bad enough for it to get a minus. Yeah, it, may, it needs a little bit of polish, but it's good. We may we may as well we may as well um clarif we may as well um nail down what what's what's um plus and minus worthy. If it if it is something that does not meet the criteria of that paragraph that I mentioned earlier, that the, that that this is that this is supposed to be not a numerical improvement in something you can already do, or an iteration of a previous ability, then if it if it if it does either of those things. Or it feels a little too close to either of those things. It's a minus. If it is, yes. if it feels like something new, relatively speaking, and big, mm -hmm. then it because gets... yep. Because I was going to say that the the perfect the 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 ability to get a, a, a max damage critical um, was new, just not big. Mm -hmm. So. Next is Berserker. Yeah. Paragon of they have their capstone is Paragon of Rage. Your your strength and constitution scores increase by four. Your maximum for these scores is twenty four. In addition, you acquire followers everywhere you go, particularly from those you have defeated and spared. Those followers base themselves in a central location of your choosing and follow the code you have set down. They can serve as a local garrison in your absence or take up work as a mercenary corp as you choose. You have an advantage on insight and charisma checks made against your followers. So this doesn't this isn't an iteration on anything done before. Yes, there were times where you would get gifts and informants and stuff going from region to region as your as your legend about yourself grew bigger and bigger with those social interaction trees that the Berserker had. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing about outright gaining what Ash would call henchmen. <laughs> uh, outright gaining followers that actually have a mechanical effect on your class and your gameplay. Mm -hmm. um, nor was there ever anything about establishing a base, but now there is a base that will establish. Um, the advantage on insight and charisma checks made against your followers is kind of just a, a tail end. But the whole thing uh, is new, absolutely, um, and that's actually really big, in, in as as well. The uh, the fact that you get followers everywhere you go, especially if you beat someone down but don't kill them, um, that that that's going to flavor the way someone's going to try to play their berserker from that point. Yeah, somebody at somebody at that tier, they're probably going to use this to start a war band. Yeah, I mean this is this is directly to uh, war boss levels. Mm -hmm. I's the biggest and I's the strongest, and y'all's got to fight me now. And and when I win, y'all's got to do what I say. And that's, that's what that boils down to. Yeah, 
And because of, because of how they word it, um, it could just as easily be say say you um say you end up you end up kicking the ass of you end up kicking the leader's ass who who runs who runs a group of bandits. Well, based on how this is written, those ba all those bandits are now your followers. Yep. Not only that, um, they can work either as a garrison or as a mercenary corps. So. Go, bandits! Make my money for me. Mm -hmm. This is also truly a uh, a Conan moment. Well, the art, the art that they used for this was was Conan wielding two gladiuses, gladii. Yep. I I refuse to 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 entertain either of those. Um. But I mean, what is best in life, monk? To crush their enemies. See them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of their women. Exactly. So I I really like this. This is a plus for me, mm -hmm. I will say. All right, next is Cleric, which gets Divine Shepherd. At it's, Whenever you are witnessed using Divine Intervention in public, slay a dangerous creature inside a population, inside a populated area, I, e.g. a dragon attacking a city, or a fiend unleashed upon a village, or complete a quest that has become well-known, disposing a despot, freeing an enslaved kingdom, restoring a treasured artifact, your following grows. Though you will always play a part in the region's history, for one month the people there give greater credence to your words. Each day you can spend one hour proselytizing in a public place in the region, making a persuasion check. A total of ten commoners, or half the result of that check, whichever is greater, are converted to your faith. These creatures trust you implicitly, share some of their secrets to try and gain your favor, and ask you for help before turn before turning to the authorities with a problem, unless you tell them not to. They follow they follow you when you leave the settlement. So this is all sounds well and good, and would be a really nice capstone. If it weren't an iteration on previous social abilities the cleric had. So, minus? This, unfortunately, misses the mark because this is just a natural expansion based on the previous, hey, yeah, you can become the head of your flock or even the one where you became non-mainstream. Uh a renegade within within your your faction. This is just a natural extension of that, which means it misses the criteria they themselves set. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely a minus. All right. Which is unfortunate because that's a really cool ability. Yeah. So next is Druid, which has three. Um, I I, 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 I already looked at Druid. Um, this is. It, <laughs> Let's go. Let's go over them so we don't so we don't do any spoiling. It's busted. Oh yeah, this is this is definitely giving me Godzilla flashbacks. I'm not gonna deny that. Just by having three, just by having three abil three um, three abilities. I mean, what are we gonna call it in level up? Since you know, cleric is no longer the the C of Godzilla. Are we just gonna call this Dzilla? Big Dickzilla. Yeah. Big, big dick druid. Oh, um, God damn it! Big swinging dick. Yep. So, uh, first we have arch druid. At twentieth level, your wild shape has no duration. In addition, when you cast a druid spell, and you you do not need you do not need scene or vocalized components or any material. I, think they... I was going to say I think I think they mean by that by that somatic component. Yeah, somatic or vocalized components. <laughs> Or any material components that have that have no cost or aren't consumed by the casting, you gain this benefit in both your normal shape and your beast shape from wild shape. So, we've literally just given that 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 ability right there that you can wild shape and use basically all of your good spells no matter what. Yeah, yeah. Say hello to indefinite wild shape wild shaping. <laughs> Indefinite wild shape, because why wouldn't you be a bigger motherfucker than you are? 
with a natural armor of some sort. At 20th level, can't you turn into a fucking dragon at that point? I or that still require polymorph. I'd have to ch I'd have to check. Uh, the, I I think it has to be a natural a, a natural. I, I can't use vanilla because the because the CR rate for dru for druids at wild shape at lower levels isn't exactly the same. I know. I know. Um so you can become a very big bad monster and also retain all of your intelligence and cast all of your fucking spells except for those which have a material component with an actual cost to it or a material component that is consumed you know what fuck it i am Any... i am looking <laughs> i am looking this and, and even then if you really really wanted to uh, to overcome that particular limitation you just put your spells that you want to cast that don't um that don't that that have those those limitations of materials that have a cost or materials that get consumed you put them in a ring of spell holding or whatever the fuck it was called mm -hmm. a magical artifact that holds the spell and you just use it you just use it like an item which you can do in wild shape that's been established for a while you just I have this ring here. I can't cast this. I, oh no! I can't cast. I can't cast fireball. Even though a druid wouldn't be the one casting fireball, but I'm going to use fireball because it has a material component that is that is consumed in the casting. Oh no! I can't cast fireball. Oh wait! I got this ring that has like a, a thousand charges of fireball on it. Fuck off and die. That's essentially what's going to happen. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> now, vanilla five e had it th had it that the C unless I'm unless I misread it the C the highest CR even at even at twentieth level that you could do wild shape in is still CR one. That's stupid and dumb. Which yeah it is, and I get I get the feeling that level ups even though we didn't see the twentieth level for it, um that's not the case. Let's see then we have yeah. life's then we have life's balance. You may cast the spells Power Word, Kill, and True Resurrection without expending a spell slot and without any material components. Once you cast either spell in this way, you cannot do so again until you finish a long rest. Um, what? <laughs> when did a druid get Power Word, Kill? What? What the fuck? I give me a moment. I need I need to look up power word kill so I can refresh myself on it on its rule set. But um, okay, hang, come on, load up, damn it. Okay, power power word kill. Let's see. Bard, sorcerer, warlock, wizard. It is not a druid spell. Yeah. Um, Instantaneous 60 feet verbal component. You utter a word of power that can p compel one creature you see within range to die instantly. If the creature you choose has 100 hit points or fewer, it dies. Otherwise, otherwise the spell has no effect. That's, that's a ninth level enchantment. What the actual fuck? You're giving druid power word kill? And we don't even know if their power word kill is vanilla power word kill, because there's still no spells! I'm okay. I'm okay. Now, something like True Resurrection, I don't have... Them getting that at 20th, I don't have as much of an issue. Just... I mean, I get, yeah, it's the balance between life and death. We're, we're upholding the balance, so we get one of each. I'm just like, did you, did you, someone on their team just really liked druids. Because even past this, we have nature weapon. We'll get to, we'll get to that. So true, re, true resurrection. It is a, it is a druid spell, which, um, li, which. Leads, which leads me to uh, to ask the very uh, to very the very obvious question: What's stopping someone from ta from taking that spell as well? 
you know, so that they can do mul they can do multiple instances of this. The reason why uh, you don't... go ahead. Probably the fact that um, True Resurrection's material components are a sprinkle of holy water and diamonds worth at least twenty five thousand GP, which are consumed. Mm -hmm. the, the, this this life's balance thing allows them to do it with just vocal and somatic components. No materials are consumed. Remember. Although that that's kind of the that's kind of negated by Arch Druid. This is a druid spell. Or, or well, aren't consumed by the casting. Never mind, I'm an idiot. Well, well, and uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was going to say, though, this is, A, you can use Power Word Kill or True Resurrection once per long rest without a spell slot and no material components. Power word kill is something a druid can't learn in the first place. True resurrection is. But to use true resurrection, you have to have a ninth level spell slot. You have to have 25,000 GP worth of diamonds. And a sprinkle of holy water. All of which get consumed. Mm -hmm. This allows you to go true resurrection with just the vocal and somatic components. So, what the fuck? Yeah, that's... What the, what the actual fuck? I only read Archdruid and Nature's Weapon. I skipped over Life's Balance going, eh, it looks, looks boring. Okay. Oh my god. And Nature Weapon. Once fuck each off, turn, nature weapon. you can use a bonus action t to choose a target point within 30 feet and one of the following element options. If the element you choose is not present at or near the target point, any damage dealt by this feature is halved. You have disadvantage. You have disadvantage on your spell attack, and creatures have advantage on any on any saving throws made to resist it. So those, all three of those, are if the element you choose is not present at or near the target point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Air. Each creature within 20 feet of that target point must make a strength save. On a failure, they take 17 or 3d8 plus 4 bludgeoning damage and flung up 20 feet away f from the target point in a random direction and knocked prone. Wait a minute. Flung up or flung 20 feet in a straight line? Yeah, that's one of those That's one of those things that should probably be eroded. Um, I, I, would, I would say that it's pro since it says in a random direction, it means 20 feet away in a sphere. Yeah, probably. This feels like a and, giant air bomb. Yeah, and here's the thing. Falling damage, Monk. For every five feet they fall, or five feet they travel at this force at, before hitting something, 1d6 damage. So if you're, fl if you're flung 20 feet away and you hit a wall, 46 damage. Or before you hit 20 feet, 46 damage. If yeah. you're flung 20 feet midair and fall, like 20 feet straight up, 46 damage after you hit the ground. And yet it doesn't mention that. Instead, it says if a thrown target strikes an object such as a wall or floor, the target takes 4 or 1d8 bludgeoning damage. That's bullshit. That's not how that works. We have rules in place for when things are thrown in a certain direction with a certain amount of force and hit something. Mm-hmm. So this, this entire line is fucking stupid. Yeah. Earth. Clumps uh, creatures within 10 feet of the target point take 4d8 bludgeoning damage and are knocked prone. A creature that makes a strength saving sa saving throw against your spell save DC takes half damage and is not knocked prone. Okay. Fire. Fire. Flames roil out. In a burst of inferno. Creatures within 15 feet of the target point take 6d6 fire damage. A creature that makes a dex makes a dex save against your against your spell save DC takes half damage, which right. means uncanny dodge applies, and they and the and half they take half no matter what, and then none if they make the dex save. Mm -hmm. um, ice, you condense and flash freeze the the water from a vast area above you into a massive boulder to drop down with immense force. Make a ranged spell attack against a creature at least 30 feet below the target point. On a hit, the creature takes 4d6 bludgeoning damage and 4d6 cold damage. 
In addition, the area in a 20-foot radius around the creature becomes difficult to rain for one minute. This sounds as bad as my magical steam blunderbusses. <laughs> I, I had magical uh, break action steam blunderbusses I, dis I, uh, I created for, this, for one of my settings um, that worked by using a minimized fireball spell contained in a crystal that was broken by a magical pick behind Grape Shot. It did 4d6 bludgeoning damage and 3d8 steam damage in a 15-foot cone. Honestly, I'd rather take the blunderbuss. Well, on top of that, the blunderbuss required proficiency or you had a 1 in 20 chance of having it explode in your hands because you didn't know how to use it right. I'd still take the blunderbuss. <laughs> but, uh... But... So... The re wait, wait a minute. You you condense and flash freeze the water. Does that mean you just need water in the area to use ice at full effectiveness, or do you need the cold? I didn't say anything about needing about needing the cold. Um, well, because because remember it says if, if the element you chose is not present at or near the target point, any damage is halved, and then all the other disadvantages and such. But it says you're condensing and flash freezing water. Does that mean if just water's nearby, ice is still at full effectiveness? Somebody I didn't think somebody did something needs an editing pass. Yes it does, but an editing pass does not a minus make. We already said that. Mm -hmm. Um water water any large or sm you create a 20 foot tall wave that travels 30 feet in one direction and then crashes down any large or smaller creatures and objects in the wave pa in the wave's path make a strength saving throw against your spell save dc on a failure a creature takes 4d8 bludgeoning damage and is carried with the wave any creature that succeeds on its saving throw takes no damage and is not moved i call so... the, i call the no damage thing into question on this I call the I call the bullshit. Four d eight bludgeoning damage for a twenty foot fall wave or twenty foot tall wave. That's... You're creating a tsunami wave, two fifths the size of what fucked the Fukushima the Fukushima Daiichi uh, reactor, and it only does four d eight bludgeoning damage. If you create a twenty foot fall a twenty foot tall wave on land. They only travels 30 feet, sure. That's death! That's not just 48 bludgeoning damage. You're killing these people! They are dying! And and everything around them. Yes! Jesus! Oh my god. I mean, it is a it is a level 20 ability, but at the same at the same time, I expect a whole lot more than 48 bludgeoning damage. This it's, at level 20, that's nothing. Yeah. Um, let's see, wood. Create splinters appear and, fl and fling themselves into flesh and armor alike. Creatures within 30 feet of the target take 4d6 piercing damage. A creature that makes a dex, a dex save against your spell takes half damage. This just reminds me of that time that I had a, a person use uh, heat, heat or cool water on large trees, on, on large maple trees to turn them into impromptu frag fragmentation grenades. Because <laughs> if you flash boil the water that's in the sap of a maple tree, it just explodes. We see this happen in real life, actually. Mm -hmm. Such as in very hot wildfires or when lightning strikes a maple tree. Uh, however, we can safely say this is a plus. They definitely hit... Their paragraph with the druid. They definitely hit it, but so, but it still leaves a really bad taste in my mouth. It leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth. This this is this is what what would Ash call this? Uh, the a symptom of the uh, 3.5e retirement home community that is 5e itself. So next is fighter, which gets two, which gets two features. First is Master of Combat. You master every maneuver you know and any future maneuvers you learn as per Maneuver Mastery. Fail. There you go. It's an iteration on a previous thing. Superior Accuracy. 
When you miss with the weapon attack while taking the attack action, you can choose to hit instead. Alternatively, you can choose to, ch to change a hit with a weapon attack into a critical hit. Or when, you score a, or when you score a critical hit, you can choose to deal your maximum weapon damage. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. This one is going in the minus category. Oh, going in the minus category. Even though superior accuracy is an interesting, an interesting, this one actually technically hits all of the levels of the paragraph except for the last part. That it has to be big. To quote uh, Darla Dimple, it has to be big and loud. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I remember in um, I remember I remember in fi in Final Fantasy D in Final Fantasy D six. Um, yes. The destiny ability that the Dark Knight had was called No Mercy, which was basically mm. meant to be an execution so foul that it promotes fear checks in nearby allies. Yep. The fighter needed something like that. You ki you kick somebody's ass with a weapon so hard that everybody is going, oh shit. And it didn't get that. What you need? Yes. This needs um. This needs a. If I need to use, if I need to use an exa an example of this kind of thing. This needs guts suddenly cutting someone in half at a in a tavern. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is this is minus because neither of these hits the paragraph. Technically superior accuracy hits every checkbox until the last one, which is it has to be something big. And it's actually something quite small, just increasing the step of your attack by one rank. Mm -hmm. A miss to a hit, a hit to a crit, a crit to max damage. Yeah. That that's that's nothing. And you can only use it once per short rest? Fuck off! <sighs> the Herald! Yes. Divine Resurrection. When you die after being reduced to zero hit points by an attack or spell that dealt 50 damage or less, after 1d4 rounds, you return to life with one hit point. You can't use this feature again for one month. Minus. Yeah, that's a minus. I mean, it, it's. It, you want to know why it's a minus monk? It's not even that it's not big. This is just lay on hands, but stronger. Pretty much. This is your self heal, but stronger. That's all this is. And you can only use it once in in game month? Holy fuck! Eat shit! And by, that's by the, a minus. By the time, and if if there's a druid in the party that, and if there's a druid in the party who's also twentieth level, they may as well just cast true resurrection on you. <laughs> just get up again, fucking pal. I mean, Harold. Mm -hmm. Now, this next one, I'm going to note, Marshall is what they seem to have renamed their warlord class. Yes, we we covered the we covered the Marshall a while a while back, and this was the only class in the entire series that gave us. Full twenty levels. Yes. So I think so. Legendary. Com so we may we may have talked about this, but let's cover it again. Legendary commander. At twentieth level, friendly creatures within range of your commanding presence add your charisma modifier minimum one to their saving throws. Additionally, choose one of the following: commander's expertise. When it whenever a creature uses your commanding presence to make an attack or use a combat maneuver, it gains an expertise die. If the combat maneuver has a save DC, it increases by an amount equal to the result of the expertise die. This cannot this expertise die cannot be increased can be increased to a maximum of D12. Feedback loop. When a creature uses your commanding presence and successfully hits their target, you gain a reaction. You must use this reaction before the start of your next turn or it is lost. Rapid deployment. After initiative is rolled and until combat ends, your speed increases by 20 feet and and allies that are able to see or hear you increase their speed by 20 feet. Um, I like then, I liked this ability, but it doesn't fit the pair. It doesn't fit what they said. Um, yeah, because it's an iteration on your commanding presence. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, supreme stronghold. Your stronghold is upgraded to grade six fortress or palace. Which and then, another iteration, another. Higher, it's that one's literally just adding numbers at that point. Which, because of because of that, as much as I, as much as I loved what they were doing with the marshal, and we really liked what they were doing with the marshal, we did. Um, 
This gets a minus. Yep. So next is Ranger. Ash's baby. Yep. And the and the one that I, and the one that I will continually argue against his point about. And the one that I will continually use as a whipping boy. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ranger's na so Nature's Scion. At twentieth level, you are a master of yourself and your natural surroundings. You familiarize yourself with any terrain type after one hour and can use the Master Tracker knack at will. In addition, you learn Primordial if you didn't already know it and gain one of the following. Elemental Mastery. By focusing on a specific natural element within 100 feet, air, fire, earth, or water, you can draw similar essences to you. After 10 minutes of concentration, a creature of that element with CR 7 or lower is drawn to your presence and becomes your loyal companion. The creature... CR 7? Yes. That's huge! And this creature the creature rolls its own initiative, has its own turns, and obeys your verbal commands. The creature disappears after one hour when it is reduced to zero hit points or when you use a bonus action to dismiss it. Once you've used this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Or summon Stampede. You can spend an action speaking directly to the spirit of nature itself to request assistance. All beasts within a mile, within a one mile radius of you, are friendly to you for ten minutes, and for the duration, are hostile to your enemies. Once you've used this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. As much as I hate the long resting, it's understandable for features this big. Mm -hmm. um, I like the fact that they can familiarize themselves with any terrain type within an hour, and they basically get master tracker even if they don't know it. Mm -hmm. Along with getting primordial, this is all things that the ranger did not have. Yes. So this is a plus. It's it's big too. Being able to get a CR seven elemental of some sort, or summon a stampede of creatures from every creature within one mile of you, one mile radius, which means two mile diameter, a two mile bubble around you. Because this also means two miles up and two miles down. So, or I mean, one mile up and one mile down. So you know, one mile into the air and one mile underground. You could summon fucking badger moles if you're so inclined to be so in the avatar universe you could summon a lot of different things depending on where you're at mm. fuck you could summon a purple worm <laughs> that's a that's a personal meme yeah a lot of my a lot of my friends have a have trauma with purple worms um did they end up watching tremors too many times no they just died to purple worms a lot they kept going the wrong way. Purple worms kept eating them. But uh, th this is definitely a plus. I will give a plus to the ranger. Yeah, look, I I want to. I'm going to. Look, I'm going. I'm going to look up what um what monsters would what. What um. Let's see. C C R seven or lower. I want to see. I want to see how far that how far that kind of thing would go. So let's see. C R. Some of the monsters that are that are that are CR seven, giant ape, oni, shield guardian, stone giant, young black dragon, young copper dragon, young dragons, young dragons. Yep. Summon summon a creature of that element. What uh black dragon's acid, isn't it? Yes. What's copper dragon? Copper dragon. Let me lo let me load that up. That is also acid. It's just good. It's just um. It's just copper dragons are chaotic good. Yeah, because they're they're metallics. Mm -hmm. I uh. Well, you couldn't get the dragons because they're not from one of the four Hellenistic elements or Hellenic elements. Excuse me. Um. But you could get things like a stone giant. A fucking stone giant. <laughs> for it's only for an hour, but still. It's a stone giant! Mm -hmm. Giants have strength above the normal cap. They hit things and they die. Yep. So yeah, range Ranger definitely gets a plus for its capstone, but let's let's face it, it's not hard to improve on garbage, and that's exactly what the vanilla 5e ra Ranger capstone was. Yes. Rogue, who has three capstones, much like 
druid, but I don't think they're going to be nearly as impressive. Okay. So the first one we have is hide in plain sight. When you see a creature look in your direction, you can use your reaction to hide, even if you have nothing to hide behind, as long as you remain in the same square without moving or taking actions. Until you move or take an action or a reaction, you are invisible to that creature. If you are targeted by an effect that requires a dexterity saving throw, you may choose to fail it to remain invisible to the creature. That That's huge. That's actually really big, depending. Yeah. It's situational, but especially if you already have like uncanny do the uncanny dodge equivalent for level up, um, you'll only take half damage by whatever th whatever's being thrown at you anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody's throwing alchemist fire in my direction. I'm gonna stay right here. That motherfucker won't see me, even though I'm on fire and hurting. Yeah, unstoppable at tw at twentieth level. No portal, be it door, window, or planar device, is is closed to you. You no longer need to make ability checks to pick locks, and you succeed automatically whenever you attempt to unlock any lock of any kind. You require no special equipment to use this feature. What? Yeah. This... What? How is it that the number two ability of both Druid and Rogue is this fucking broken? <laughs> Rogue Rogue gets the ability to fucking Nocturne Skeleton Key everything? <laughs> what? Yeah. Giving Druid power where it kill when it doesn't have access or true resurrection without needing exorbitant fees for materials. And Rogue the ability to just unlock all... It's console commands. They gave the rogue <laughs> console commands. If only, I, if only I had the ability to skip mini to skip unlocking when it came to Alpha Protocol's lock picking. <sighs> Which I am, I am. Okay, let's go to number three. Skill mastery. Also at twentieth level, you are unparalleled in your chosen fields. For each skill and tool proficiency in which you have an expertise die, you gain another expertise die in that skill or proficiency. Your expertise dice can be upgraded from a D8 to a D10, or from a D10 to a D12 in this way. So skill mastery is just adding numbers. Mm -hmm. But the other two skills are fucking ridiculous. I'd say it meets you. I'd say it meets the big category. Does it meet the something different category? Yes. Hide in plain sight is not something anyone can do. Not even a rogue before twentieth level. They have to have a way to hide and and initiate the stealth check. This doesn't even initiate a check. You're just like I'm invisible to that person right there, and you don't move. And there you go. You're invisible to that person right there. Mm -hmm. And, and unstoppable, yes, they have the ability to, to pick locks initially, but this removes the need. This isn't an iteration. This isn't adding numbers. This is this is Goku versus Superman. This is limits versus none. Mm -hmm. Did, this is a plus, Monk. I don't care if if the last one fails to meet the, the, their paragraph. The other two exceed it by such a wide margin that this is a plus. All right. Dear God, whoever whoever dedicates to be rogue to 20 deserves this. I'm sorry. So next is Sorcerer. Sork. And, and, he, and Sorcerer has Arcane Clutch and Explosive Magics. Oh, dear God. So let's start with Arcane Clutch. Starting at 20th level, you can reclaim some fraction of the energies you expend as you cast. Whenever you cast a spell of 3rd level or higher, you gain sorcery points equal to a third of the spell level. That's new, right. but it's not big. Mm -hmm. Explosive Magics. The magic you bring to bear can be made to build upon itself. When you cast a spell of 4th level or lower that deals damage, 
You can spend a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level to re-roll any dice that have the maximum result and add them to the table. T total. For example, if you cast exploding fire an exploding fireball and roll three sixes among your damage dice, you roll an additional 3d6 and continue to roll any sixes, adding them to the total damage result. I don't know why I said result at the end when it says dealt. As cool as exploding dice for your damage magic is, it's only for fourth level or lower. And it technically falls under the clause of adding numbers. Like, as cool as that is, as big as that is, as new as that is, it still falls under the clause of adding numbers. Um, fourth level sorcerer spells are as follows. Banishment, Blight, Confusion, Dimension Door, Dominate Beast, Greater Invisibility, Ice Storm, Polymorph, Stone Skin, Wall of Fire. So Wall of Fire, Ice Storm, and I believe... What else does damage in, out of those two? Or out of them? Um, wall of Storm, wall, wall of Fire, Ice Storm, and what else? I keep, I'm thinking Blight, but I need I need to check. I'll check here real quick. Yeah, it, do, yeah, to... it does. At least on at least so, on a failed at least on a failed save of it. Yeah. So, so this again, Arcane Clutch is new but not big. Explosive Magics is big and new, but still technically adding numbers. I don't know if you want to balance them out and say this is a plus, or if you want to say that technically it's a minus. I don't uh, know. I'm, I'm, putting the, I'm putting this at... Because of the fact that Arcane Clutch is still, is, still, is still messing around with an established mechanic, and so is Explosive Magics, I'm putting this down as a minus. Okay. I can see it. All right. We are now at Warlock. Let's hope they did something good. Let's see. First we have Aura of Anathema. At 20th level, hostile creatures within 120 feet gain vulnerability to necrotic damage. A creature with resistance to necrotic damage instead loses its resistance, and a creature immune to necrotic damage instead replaces that immunity with resistance. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can, ch you can choose a different damage type for your aura. That is both... Th that's new... That is not adding numbers, that is not an iteration, and that is big. Being able to strip things of resistance, or even give them vulnerability, and it's only to people who are hostile to you, that's huge. And the fact that you can choose a different damage type for the aura, even bigger. That's... You, you could... Go ahead. You could, for all intents and purposes, change the aura's f aura to force-type damage, since all of their Eldritch Blast ver varieties still only do force-type damage, and make it so that anything fighting you, no matter what happens, it's going to it's going to take damage from force-type damage, mm -hmm. and some of it will take much much more damage from force-type damage than others. Yeah, it's it's it's. It's, uh, frankly, it's, um, it's, it's a bit OP. All right. Next is Highest Arcanum. At 20th level, you learn an ultimate exploit in the Laws of Magic. Choose one of the following. Either A, you can cast Plane Shift without material components once between short rests. You're under c the constant effects of the Foresight spell. This effect cannot be detected or dispelled by any means short of Wish. Or once per day, you can spend one minute in arcane contemplation to regain your spent spell points. What? Okay. Spent sp <laughs> What? You spend one minute once per day to regain all lost spent spell points. Because the spell points were already based off of shorter long rest, mm -hmm. but just to just for people who are unaware, foresight, casting time one minute, range touch, components, vocal, somatic, and material, a hummingbird feather, duration eight hours. 
You touch a willing creature and bestow a limited ability to see into the immediate future. For the duration, the target can't be surprised and has advantage on attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws. Additionally, other creatures have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target for the duration. What this essentially does to your 20th level warlock is make them nigh unkillable. And, and and constant and a constant any one of these three is super fucking useful. Plane shift once per short rest with no material components? Because the material components for plane shift are fucking expensive. That's uh that's um I think that I think there may be I think there may be a bit of a um a bit of a typo here. Because what do you mean? Warlocks do not have spell points. Sorcerers have that. They have spe they have spell sl they have spell slots, and and the whole thing with invocate and the whole thing no. with invocations. No, 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 no. Warlocks have have sorcery points. No, um, sorcerer sorcerers have sorcery points. Oh yeah, I mean sorcerers have sorcery points. Mm -hmm. Warlocks. Was it wizards that had spell points or warlocks? Warlocks have it. Warlocks have invocations. But hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Fine. No, no. Remember, their version of the warlock does have spell points. All right, all right. I'm, I'm. My bet, my bad on that. My bad on that front. Yeah, the spell points are basically used to just freeform cast spells without preparing them. Which I remember we having, I remember us having some bit of issues with that, but um. Well, because it essentially boils out to the same thing. So. But yeah, so with with by the way with with plane shift, the material component is a forked metal rod with it that is worth at least two hundred fifty GP, and is attuned to a particular plane of existence. So, choosing plane shift means you don't need to get the forked metal rod, which 250 GP is not much. But, attuning it to a specific plane of existence is. The difficulty is not in the price, it's in the fucking attunement. Um, choosing any of these, choosing any of these three, is fucking broken. On top of the aura of anathema... This is this is all a plus. This is all a plus. Being able to get all your your spent spell points for the day from the for one minute in a in a full day, so you can get you basically get two times your spell points every day. Excellent, excellent. Uh, being under the constant effects of foresight unless somebody casts wish on you, which ain't which doesn't come cheap. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, just so everybody knows, Wish was changed for 5e. <clears throat> mm. Wish! It's used to duplicate any other spell of 8th level or lower as a basic use. Uh, you can also com create an object up, up to 25,000 GP in value that isn't a magic item. And the object, uh, you can allow up to 20 creatures that you see to regain all hit points. Um, but then there was the the whole, the, the one thing I hated about Wish was, uh, about the new Wish, was that, um, that if you cast a spell to produce an effect other than duplicating another spell, uh, Each time you cast a spell until you finish a, lo a long rest, you take 1d10 necrotic damage, and the damage can can't be reduced. In addition, your strength drops to 3 for 2d4 for two d four days. For each of those days you spend doing nothing more than light activity, your remaining recovery time decreases by 2 days. And then there's a 33% chance that you are unable to cast Wish ever again if you suffer the stress. I don't know why they put more limitations on Wish and then that on top of it, which is stupid. 
When it already like, had a fair amount of limitations as it was. Well, if we look at how Wish works in 3.5, um, you had to spend experience, if I remember correctly. Technically, it was called Greater Wish. Well, no, it was... So Normal Wish was Sork or Wiz. The components were Vocal and Experience. Yeah. And it co and it cost you a minimum of five thousand XP. Mm -hmm. oh. So, I, I personally I, I think that the the new wish in Five E is actually much lesser than how Wish was previous, which is a um it's a loss because Wish was Wish was that spell that. You could only really cast it once, maybe twice, ever, without permanently losing some levels. That would then be, need to be hard one to get back. But it was also, th like, it was that fuck you to the Tarask. I wish you stay dead. That you lose your regeneration. Of course, 5e has also fucked up the Tarask, so we won't get into that. But yeah. All three of these are broken. The Order of Anathema, broken. Warlock gets a plus. They're new, they're big, they're not reiterations on other things. It's a plus. <laughs> Druid, Rogue, and Warlock are fucked, bro. So next we have the, we have the final entry in Wizard. Which once again gets two, gets two, and based on just based on the amount of text with the second one, I have a bad feeling about this. I uh, I had to too. All right, let's start at the top. Greater intensity. At twentieth level, you can choose an additional option from the spell intensity list. You can use each of these options once between long re rests without suffering hit point reduction, but can't use both on the same casting. Fails. It's an iteration, and it's adding numbers. Fails. Did we ever Outright. Co did we ever cover spell intensity? I don't. Um, I don't even remember that. I. Yeah. You, yeah let's uh. <laughs> let's let's uh. Let's go take a quick look. Let's. Uh, blah 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 blah. Wizard, there you are, wizard. Come I. Play test up. I don't see anything. About spell in about spell intensity doesn't exist. Which I'd be able to comment more if you actually put in a fucking spell rules. Oh. Yeah, I ju yeah I just I just looked at the wizard PDF. There's nothing in there about spell intensity. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Mage, <sighs> let's see, then Mage Sight. At Your eyes become attuned to the supernatural. You cannot be blinded, and you can see normally in darkness, both magical and non-magical, to a distance of 120 feet. You also sense the presence of magic within 120 feet of you. You automatically see the aura around any visible creature or object in the area that bears magic, and learn its schools of magic. In addition, you can use an action to cast Identify without expending a spell slot, and when you can see a, cr a creature, use spell casting to cast a spell. You instinctively know what spell is being cast before its casting is complete. This does not tell you what level spell slot is being used to cast the spell. Your ability to see magic with Mage Sight can penetrate most barriers, but is blocked by 10 feet of stone, 1 foot of common metal, a six inch thick sheet of lead or twenty feet of wood or dirt. It's super it's Superman's eyes. <laughs> it's um it's basically uh It's X ray vision. It, not exactly X ray vision. It's it's a combination of the devil sight invocation from Warlock along with some of the magical sight uh magical sensory and magical sight effects from other things. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it is a gish of a, of an ability, much like there are gishes of, of characters. Um, 
It's not big enough. No, it's... It's certainly big, but this is not something that you would gain at 20th level. This is something you would gain at, like, 12th. Mm -hmm. And only as a choice between other abilities that are equally as useful. Um, wizard gets a minus. Yeah. Especially since we have no idea what the fuck spell intensity is! And I can make some guesses on how I, on how I do that kind of thing, but at the, at the same time, that's just me making guesses. I'm guessing it means minimized, maximized, etc. You know, things that Sorcerer already has! Yeah. So... So how many minuses do we have, Monk? Because I'm pretty sure we have more minuses than pluses. Let me let me move over all the mi all the minuses down to down to the bottom. <sighs> so give me a give me a second on this. Do, 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 do. Okay, after a bit of cleanup. Pluses. Bard, Berserker, Druid, Ranger, Rogue, Warlock. Minuses. Adept, Cleric, Fighter, Herald, Marshal, Sorcerer, and Wizard. This is a tie game? Um, no, that's si six pluses and seven minuses. So I was right. It is... And when it comes to, I feel like, um, I feel like for some, for something like say adept, their capstone, their capstone, instead of having their capstone be a boosted version of version of martial arts, I'd, pr I'd probably, I'd probably have it that, th that one of, one of their boosts is, it is, um, is allow, is allowing them to. Any anytime they're anytime they're making attacks, it's always treated as if they're using flurry. Mm -hmm. Um, or or some or something like you can use when using flurry, you can use two effects out of it instead of one. It is it 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 is technically adding, but it's put but it's putting a lot more combo potential into the adept, a class that is all about combos. Yeah. Um. As far as far it, and as far as the, and as far as the other thing, just ha just have it just have it that e that um, each su each successful attack you get one you get one exertion back. It'd be it give someone an, an incentive to keep do to keep doing combos. Would I would in doing this I'd be turning the adept into a Street Fighter character? Yes, that's basically what it is anyways. So what's stopping me? It's also what we did with the rebuild of the original classes. Yeah. Um, as far as as far as how as far as how to fix something like cleric, um, I'd say I'd say get I'd say just drop the whole drop the whole divine intervention thing. It's got it's gotten a good enough ability as it is, but I don't see the reason why divine intervention is necessary for it. Just do just doing the just doing the appropriate deed should be enough. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as far as as far as fighter, I'm go I'm going I'm going with I'm going with what I, with what I said beforehand. You um. Whenever 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 you, whenever you do whenever you do a. Cr the idea that I have for this is whenever you do a critical, you can automatically force a um. Let's let's say let's say either let's say either a um a inti a intimidation or a or a or a diplom or a diplomacy check. Basically, you're basically it's a morale check against the enemy. Either either they're horrified by by the fact that holy shit you just cut that guy in half, or they're impressed of holy shit you just cut that guy in half. Yeah. The whole the whole point is you're supposed you're supposed to be a complete master of of martial skill. Um, for the for the um, herald, um, 
I'm actually I'm actually not sure what um not in, what would you what would you consider to be a good capstone for the concept of the herald? Is I'm gonna. This is gonna. This is gonna sound. Uh, this is gonna sound very, very, very uh, cliche. But um, literally turn them into a holy avenger. Make it a skill where they can call down an avatar of the god on themselves to to partially go through apotheosis and uh, for a certain amount of time act as a, as a as if they have a, a half divine template and such. I'd be willing to. I'd be willing to go with that. It's just they, they they can only use that like once per something. Can be used all the time. That's something that, would, that you'd probably put one, that you'd probably put at least once per once per twenty four hours or a week. I'd even I'd even go so far to say that they can that they can summon a heavenly host. And and I would I wouldn't even say once per X. I would say that they would have to do X works for their god mm -hmm. for their cause for whatever it is that they follow they would have to do x specific like a specific calling higher than what they already normally do these feats kind of like the, the feats of heracles um the labors of heracles in fact mm -hmm. that they would have to do in order to show themselves worthy for such a such an intervention again yeah um uh, as far as far as as far as um as far as Marshall, I remember us liking the abil liking the ability, but it's just an extension of commanding presence. Um, I'm not really sure there is a way to work around that, especially since what they did is they uh, that's part of them rebuilding the whole class. Mm -hmm. I think that that might be a vestige of the entire class building process. And so it's kind of baked in. Yeah. Um, it's not bad by any means. And it's it, it, it's just, it doesn't meet that cri the criteria of that paragraph they gave us. Um, and honestly, since it is a brand new from the ground up, even though they were taking ideas from the Warlock of 4E a little bit. Warlord. Uh, or Warlord, yes, excuse me. I know what I meant to say, I just said the wrong word. Mm -hmm. um, I... I honestly think it can be kept as is, even though it, it fails to meet that one paragraph they said. Yeah. Um, because in this case, it isn't it isn't a repurposing of an older class. All right. Um, how would when it, what about um, sorcerer's capstone? Uh, you know, that one's a little harder. Because Sorcerer already does so much that's pretty flamboyant and flashy and big in the class itself. How about how about um, this? Tra um, the a bit we already we already we already mentioned the whole um, ap apotheosis template. How how about we do this? They get they they get a they get a greater elemental template. Okay, yeah, they could they could and for them it would be a permanent change, unlike with a. With the herald temporarily calling whatever divinity into himself to become an avatar of his god on the field, uh, this this could be permanent, and it would have to tie into um, their sorceress uh, the 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 uh, what were they called the the origin. Yes, I'd say I'd say in that regard, at twentieth level, they probably gained the ability to transform into a living spell. Or into, um, I mean, a living spell could be one thing, but or into, uh, they they'd get the the actual elemental template mm -hmm. for whatever their 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 the font of their power is. Like if they chose fire a bunch of times, yeah, they become a fire elemental. Mm -hmm. That would actually be a really cool capstone to yeah. actually become something beyond what you were. Yeah, and the the there when we were going through the sorcerer, there was this implication that they that they, that they um that they were the embodiment of the of the whole phenomenal cosmic power, semi phenomenal, nearly cosmic power. 
Yeah, but ba itty bitty living space. But basic, basically, basically a um, basically an uncorked bottle of of arcane energies. Yes. Um. But again, itty bitty living space. Yep. And the wizard. Um. Ah, <sighs> oh, the wizard. Um. You know. Which uh, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to put this out there right now. When it comes to class design, I consider the wizard to be the worst designed class in Fifth Edition. It is, and even, even more than Ranger, which is saying something. Um, in Level Up Five E, they did a lot to try and fix that, but failed to make hit the mark. Mm -hmm. Um. I think their 20th level should be the ability um... You know how you know how the druid was able was able to cast was able to cast certain spells um without without needing without needing a good amount of components they basically could cast any spell that had material components that weren't consumed or material components that didn't have a cost. I I feel that should be I feel the wizard should get should get that as well. Um one um other, one other one other thing that I'd be willing to go with is um the for, is that the first spell that they cast on the, on their turn that's fourth level or lower is uses a bo uses a bonus action. I'm basically giving them double cast from um the, from the red mage in Final Fantasy. Yeah, um I was thinking something a little more grandiose than that. That in that they that they could establish their own arcane territory. You know, like, they probably have a mage tower, but I mean one in which this place now becomes a font of arcane power. Making, uh, ma making the ability to permanently engrave magic on, on a location that is considered their stronghold, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, we could call this engraving or anchoring, however you want to call it, but they could use it to for example, um, create a pool in their in their tower that is always full of clean water because they've engraved the spell for create water into this pool. And, and you know, small things like that, but also bigger things like they <laughs> engraved the entirety of the spell for planar shift into the tower. And it has tuning forks for every one of the planes. So they can planar shift to any plane they want using this engraved thing in their in their mage domain, whatever their mage domain might be. Mm -hmm. um, th things of that nature. A, 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 str a stronghold and territory full of the ability to engrave magic. All right. Now... Because that... When I think of a wizard... Mm -hmm. When I think of a wizard in most fantasy, and I think of the highest examples of wizards, these are guys who have been around for literally hundreds of years, have a bunch of magic that they've learned and scoured the world for behind them, and have a place to call their own that anyone comes a knock in that they don't like, um, you better be expecting some almighty smiting. Because wizards don't like to be bugged by people they don't like. Wizards are also somewhat capricious in who they like that day. <laughs> Sometimes their best friend is an annoyance. But I think I think the wizard capstone should be something along the lines of of if you don't have a stronghold, you gain a stronghold at you know tier two something smaller but if you do have a stronghold uh you know both gain the ability to whichever whichever one you get 
gains the ability to have engraved magic for permanent use. So you can engrave, you know, create water onto a basin. Now you no longer need, I mean, create water is a very small spell, so it's not going to take a lot of doing. But now you don't need any of the vocal or somatic or material components associated with the spell. It Where you've engraved it, it can be used. Just, you know, you have to you have to command it, and that's really it. Mm-hmm. Whereas something like, if you, let's say you wanted to engrave Meteor Swarm on your tower, that's going to still take you spending spell slots, um, obviously. But all it is is spending the spell slot. All of the other components are in the engraving at that point. And so you just inject your magical power into this engraving, and there's Meteor Storm. I think that would be a cool idea for a for a, a wizard. It also capstone. it also guarantee that that nobody go nobody goes near the wizard's tower ever again. <laughs> he can call down stars from the sky. They're on fire. What? He did it to Harold. How do you think Harold lost his arm and my beard? What's a dwarf without a beard? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Instead, instead of, be, instead of beware of dog, it's be, it's be, it's beware of golems or something. Yeah, yeah. Be, beware of mimics. What? He's turned everything into mimics. What? <laughs> or, or just, or, or just surround, or just surround the forest with, just surround the um, wizard's tower with a bunch of trees that are actually ants. But we hate ants. I'd rather surround the the, the, the tower with uh, gibbering mouthers. <laughs> well, the ants don't attack. They just they just talk all on and on about trees constantly. Yeah, the gibbering mouthers, gibbering mouthers. Come on. Yeah, but the they gibbering don't... mouthers only speak nonsense. And they eat people. <laughs> um. I was also th- I was also thinking of an ar- of a wizard's tower sur- in the desert surrounded by bullets. <laughs> you think, hey, there's and this tower. There's this tower in the desert. Fin- finally, we're saved. It's an oasis. And, Roar! <laughs> and then, all and then all of a sudden, wait, why is why is the sand shifting? Why do I hear the Jaws music? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I honestly, I honestly think that that's probably the best capstone we could give Wizard, which is. <laughs> yeah, I I can I can certainly go with that. And if this, if it if this were a game like if this were a setup like Axe, um, that could <laughs> certainly be used. Yep. Because 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 that game has has stronghold systems built into literally every class. Yeah. Um. But I think. But given that given that the the um the Kickstarter for Level Up Five E is going to be going live in about ten weeks. Um. I think this is as good a time as any. To give our to give our final thoughts and final assessments on Level Up Five E, and I wish Ash were here to give hit to give his piece. Yeah, that would be nice. But for me, for me, Level Up Five E as a whole frustrates me, and it's it ver- it's a very it feels very piezo in the sense of being one step forward, two steps back. You had you had. You were on the cusp. You were on the cusp of. I'll put it like this: What is what is worse, to actually suck, or to be just on the cusp of greatness, but then but then dial it back at the eleventh hour? Indeed. When it comes to when it comes to this, it has been a it has been a slow descent into the heart of darkness. When we started, th- when I started this little thing, and I dragged you and Ash along, I had l- I had legitimate optimism for le- for this project because I th- because I had predicted that an advanced five E 
would ev would eventually make its appearance just by just by sheer time and mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. However, as we as we went in, it it very much felt like the people that they were taking advice from on this project were grogs who did, who wanted something that was more and more similar to vanilla 5e when the whole point is that this is an advanced 5e and the thing that i think i think really pissed us off is one of the things that they had nailed that they had nailed down to a science that that we absolutely loved up until we read through the adept was the narrative arc we were seeing with cl with classes yes it and that's what that's why a, a few weeks back i brought up the comparison between that and the 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 fu the um ti the tight a bit that this was a better version of the titles that were in eight that were in um D and D and mm -hmm. um, and at some at some point in time they ended up losing that and the narrative weight of a lot of abil of a lot of abilities was significantly reduced if not outright expunged yes there's also the there's also the fact that there that as we've mentioned before, it definitely feels like there wasn't a guide, there wasn't an, an overall guiding hand on the ship when it came to the when it came to the team of writers because there's a lot of writers on this, and it's mm -hmm. impossible to tell who's going to get credit for what. This is also the reason. This is also um, present with the fact that a lot of the stuff we've seen in the journeys chapter feels very divorced from what we've seen before. Yes, and truth be told. If there's anything if there's anything to take from this, this particular method of playtesting, I don't think should be replicated. I really think I really think that a that when someone's doing a playtest of their thing, it should be the it should be the full setup so one can look at the one can look at the rule set in its totality. Instead of instead of doing this segmented thing. Um I know whenever I, I know that some people will defend this kind of segmenting because uh, Wizards does something similar with Unearthed Arcana. I don't like Unearthed. Or, I don't like the Five E Unearthed Arcana either. I would mu I would much ra I would much rather have a few have a few ex have a few experimental splat books than th than that really segmented almost almost pa almost video game patch patch updates style of unearthed arcana largely because of the fact that i don't f i shouldn't feel the need to keep up to keep updated when when signi when significant significant changes to certain classes happen like say what's happened with the ranger over the past five years and when when it comes to when it came when it came to the exploration next as we saw them on they started to have less and less narrative weight which yeah. is kind of defeating the purpose, and basically became feats in another coat of paint. Yep. The the um the big the big takeaway from this is that level up five e has str has strong ideas, but their ideas that they end that they end up that they end up putting a ball and chain around their own necks for in the in the name of being in the name of being like vanilla when re when really they sh when really they should have been go they should have been going f much more um all out mm -hmm. um if i if i can liken this if i can liken and if there's an example i can think of of doing this kind of doing this kind of thing right or at least more right i would say the un i would say the unchained classes from pathfinder first edition which even though the, even though there was issue of support obviously they were a, they were a very significant change from their vanilla counterparts mm -hmm. um and what and um of co of course the, of course I could also bring up the whole difference between basic and advanced D and d which is going to be kind going to be kind of my benchmark for this for this sort of thing or or sim or similar um ha or similar hacks to 
to three to three point oh and three point five like Trailblazer. Yeah. But adv but advanced advanced fifth edition the big the I'd say one of the biggest one of the one of the big problems when trying to do any sort any sort of iteration upon D and D like this is the amount of is the amount of voices demanding that you go a certain direction, which is the reason why I'm glad I will never work for Wizards of the Coast. Mm -hmm. Um, I it fe it felt early on that they were trying to do um, a modern D and D sensibility with some of the with some of the narrative tools that were seen in early versions of D and D. Somehow mm -hmm. that ch somehow that changed, and what I will end what I will endlessly find hilarious in the in this regard is for the for over a decade i have heard people talk up a storm about how D, about how um D 4th edition is bet was better served as a as a tactical board game or was too much of a video game or similar things when in re, when in my personal opinion 5th edition is far more guilty of being a video game than 4th edition ever was and with something mm -hmm. like with something like this, with the with the with the slope with the fact that they were tr they were killing off all of their great all of their ideas, I kept getting flashbacks to my experience with D and D Next, where they had legitimately good ideas that they slowly killed off in the name of being classic, or in the or in the name of being not fourth edition. So in that in that regard, I, in that regard, I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. This is a, this this is as Racevic would say, proof that multiple personality disorder does not does not lead to con, is not a conducive lead for game development. Mm -hmm. And as far as whether or not I'm go, whether or not I would do a full review of Level Up when it when it fi, when it finally releases because. It's going. It's going to make. It's going to make its goal for Kickstarter. It's En World. They've got. Yeah. They've got. They've got the. They've got the name recognition on that front. Yeah. But, I, do not see. I do not see myself doing so immediately. Maybe after. Maybe after a significant enough price drop, or if it's on bundle of. If it's on bundle of holding or humble bundle, maybe. But. As far, but as far as hacks of fifth edition, there are much bigger priorities for me. I would much you would you would be more likely to see me cover something like low fantasy gaming or spheres of power and might first before I cover level up five e. Um, hell, even I would sooner I would sooner cover Naruto five e than I'd co then cover level up five e at this juncture. I mean, it still has some of the tr it still has some of the issues with Five E that I have, but Naruto Five E is a lot bet is a lot more interesting than it should be. <laughs> Naruto Five E, well, it fuck me for saying this, but it doesn't suck. I mean that, that there's no reason to to uh, to disparage you for it. Naruto can be entertaining, and if it doesn't suck, then it doesn't suck. Got to call a spade spade. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> same thing. Go same thing goes with Pokemon Five E. Although I pr I prefer I prefer Tabletop United, but that's just that's just my own personal preference. Mm -hmm. So with my with my um with my long and with my long long ass r rant about my complete disappointment, um. What I guess it. What is what has well, been your take? So, um, Monk has covered many of the things that I also would complain about in this in the decline of this once hopeful and bright uh, potential we saw. The the initial out. The initial outset of the classes, as we reviewed them one by one, even the destiny and, and, and inspiration systems were unique and refreshing. They had the narrative and the mechanical married, and exploration looked like it was going to be married as well. It is very clear that after 
after we hit the adept, that marriage was a divorce. Um, and it was a really bad one too. Clearly, mechanics got all of the uh, the, the the belongings and is getting alimony from narrative and from exploration. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, we saw the most egregious portions of this with the warlock, where the narrative arc was a missing entirely. There were no skills tied to the narratives that tied the narratives to the mechanics. Those those three skills you would choose at certain levels or choose between at certain levels uh, to to get a narrative advantage. Even other classes who did it poorly still did it. Now, those other classes may have been worse in other ways. I remember us raiding. Uh, which class was it after Warlock Herald? Yeah. Um, and let, we me and, and let me check. Was, yes, it was Harold. And, and we rated Harold even lower than Warlock because Harold was just so milk toast and blasé. Rather than being outright bad, it was just boring. Which, even bad, can be entertaining. As much as we shit on the Ranger, we, we still have fun. Mm -hmm. Boring is just boring. And we see more of that each time you advance from Adept all the way up to Herald. And then finally, as we stepped into Journeys here, everything became generic. And not generic over in the, in the term of, oh, this is just a generic storytelling device, but generic as in, this is just generic D&D. &D. This is not something new anymore. This isn't innovation anymore. It's just old shit repackaged and tied up with a pretty bow. And we even proved that we saw the potential and could milk it and use it better than EN World was in more recent times when Ash and I took two and a half hours to plot out, name, and describe the effects of narrative married narrative and mechanic mechanical social uh skills for the warlock we took two and a half hours to do that it was the bulk of that episode mm -hmm. and we showed that we could do en world's job better than en world additionally i would like to point out that while we did see the whole some of these look like they're written out by authors that are just copy pasting things and some of these look like they have actual thought behind them what looked to be about four separate author writing styles we didn't start seeing that disparate element until the adept as well everything seemed very cohesive in the early classes like whatever writing was being written was then going through a central department and being homogenized under a specific format Part of me thinks that they lost an editor, or maybe a, a team of editors, at that time when they started caving, if they are indeed caving. I, I'm only making assumptions based on what I see, and my assumptions could be wildly off mark. But around the adept, we, when we stopped seeing that marriage of narrative and mechanics, that those social skills that were really cool and, and lent a narrative arc to each class, we also saw those separate writings, and I'm wondering if those editors were either shit-canned or left because this was no longer innovating. It was kowtowing to grogs. Again, this is all speculation. Mm -hmm. um, I could be wildly off mark. EN World could come out and say, no, that's not what happened. Here's what happened. And show us what happened. Whether, it, and, whether it's gro and. I do want to clarify that when I'm referring to when I'm referring to grogs, and I think when you're referring to grogs in this case, we're not talking about the uh, we're not talking about the first edition or nothing kind of grog. We're no. talking about the, we're talking about the people who um, who want who are this who wanted this to be as exact to vanilla five e as possible. 
Yeah, yeah they wanted they wanted this to just be a continuation of vanilla 5e rather than an advancement and an innovation on top of vanilla 5e. Yeah. Which is which is what EN World initially touted this as, an advancement, advanced 5th edition. Mm -hmm. Something that innovates on the basic premise. And while we got that in the beginning, in the end, it was gone. I have no, at this point, I have no expectations. What, what, what we had in the beginning is squandered. The trust is squandered. I have no trust. And that's hard to get back for anyone. If EN World were to tell me they would give me a copy of the finished product for free, all I had to do was play it and give a review, I would likely say no. Because I have no faith that it would be anything other than 5e with a new coat of paint and some new words. So in the end, more than anything, these, this, this valley has led me to feel betrayed. There, I feel like I got a bait and switch. Nine pieces of bait is a lot of bait, but the switch is much more egregious. And because of that, uh, if we do end up later on down the line revisiting this valley with a with a where are they now sort of thing, um, I will likely have to concede to anything you may have read about it, Monk, because I certainly will not be keeping up with it. Uh. Um, I can safely say that if this if this was a representation of what the final book would look like, I am a, I am of the I would be of the opinion of giving this my score of a void, which is a score you do not give often. No. I mean, we gave it to Avatar Legends on the, on the last valley for that. Yeah. And he, even even then, that was the that was the first time in a long that was the first time in years that I've given a void to something. Mm-hmm. And well, if you guys want specifics on why he gave, we gave that a void, it's a it's very different reasons from this. Mm -hmm. uh, their play test is at least coherent and homogenized, so the format makes sense. But uh, that's all I'll say on that. Yeah. In the end, this was this was finding the rotting sewage plant behind the idyllic uh, behind the idyllic uh, um, wilderness scene that you've seen that that some people may have seen in certain cartoons and such you 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 look on the wilderness scene traipse through the forest and come upon the heavy polluting factory dumping sludge into the river mm -hmm. that's what this feels like that's the type of betrayal i feel in all of this so ian world if you do ever watch these if you have been watching these if you've been listening at all my point is this bring back the innovation do what was do what was working well in the early documents and felt good and right and ignore the naysayers of that new format even if they're internal very very much so and that that is while well, I said that this is a season finale for for le for um for uh, for level up that is not the end of the valley of the judged because some because there are there is a, there are there is one, there is going to be there is going to be one follow up that we that is going to happen in August because we talked we talked a bit about legend of the elements 
when we when we were doing the when we were doing the Valley of the Judges on Avatar Legends. And I think it I think it's high time to follow to follow through on the, to follow through on that. Because I because as I've mentioned in the past, I love contrast. In addition, the other the other um we do have one there is one more Valley of the Judge that I do have that I do have on the pipeline after giving myself a brief hiatus. Um some of you may recall that I in, that a while back I interviewed the creator of a work of a game in progress called Heavens and Heresies, which is currently mm. being which is currently going to be published under the um under the Stormforged Games banner. Nice. Which is, is nice. He's because Stormforger is a good guy. Um but I but because of the, because of the fact that that he is doing the 5e setup with a heavy emphasis on team play and an, and an, and a equally heavy emphasis on tactics and if his ranger is any indication he 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 and us seem to be on similar wavelengths i felt that that would provide a interesting bit of contrast especially since both games are technically not out yet at the, at the time of this recording so we'll probably end up we'll probably end up doing that in the sim, in a similar format to what we did here um at the tail end of the month so there's so there's that there's certainly that to look forward to plus a f plus a few other things and if all if all goes if all goes well I may end up being on the other end of the of the interview dichotomy later in August but that is going to do it for the, for this particular adventure in the Valley of the Judged. I would like to sincerely thank everyone who took the time out of the out of their schedule to come and li come and listen to us ramble about 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 um, game design for a few hours each week. And these are all these are always a hell of a lot of fun. And I hope to do these again in the future, just with better games. But <laughs> until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>